Hello, assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Hope you guys are feeling great this morning. Thank you everyone for being here with us today, for spending your time by joining our main event and welcome to the journalism e-colloquium entitled Digital Safety for Journalists Combating the Rising Threats brought to you by semester 5 students majoring in journalism from the Faculty of Communication and Media Studies, UITM Shah Alam. To our guests of honor, deputy deans, professors, head of centers, course coordinators, lecturers, members of faculties, ladies and gentlemen, students from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia UPI, President University, UCSI University, University Kebangsaan Malaysia UKM, University Technology Mara UITM, and other universities as well. Welcome to the 43rd Journalism E-Colloquium, June 2021. Before we begin, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Halina Aziz, currently a Semester 5 Journalism student, and I will be serving as a moderator for today. Thank you for the opportunity given, and I am very much looking forward to this sharing session where we have invited three high-caliber and experienced panelists in discussing the topic of cyber safety and digital threats. As you, are, as you all are well aware, our panelists for today's program are Dr. Kavita Muti, a Chief Strategy Officer at Intelize Tech Services, Ms. Fabriana Firdaus, an independent investigative journalist based in Bali, Indonesia, and Mr. Ramani Parkunan, a Senior Editor at Asia News Today Network. They will be sharing with us different perspectives on the importance of digital safety for journalists throughout these sessions. For the first session, we will be having cybersecurity in the front mind of journalists. The second session will be news agency and journalist vulnerability to cyber threats. And for the third session will be the sharing of cybersecurity toolkit for journalists. Again, to ensure a smooth running event, you are required to mute yourself while the session is taking place, as we do not want to encounter any disruptions. You may turn on your camera to ensure full participation. If you have any questions regarding the discussion, do not hesitate to comment and write your questions in the chat box as we will be having a Q&A session right after each session. Write your questions along with your name and which university you are from. The questions can be written in English or Malay. Also, we are having a giveaway and a lucky draw, proudly sponsored by Sugar Bomb and Bluebell Skincare. So, in order to win the giveaway, um, during the forum session, write your questions in the chat box, and the six most interesting ones will be given air fresheners from Sugar Bomb. Two winners will be chosen in each session of the talk, just write as many as interesting questions you can think of and we will decide who will be the winner. The winners will be announced at the end of the third Q&A session. Also, for the lucky draw session, two lucky winners will be selected by the roulette wheel and are determined based on your registration number. So, do not forget to register yourself for a chance to win a complete set of Bluebell Skincare worth 259 ringgit Malaysia. Do stay with us until the end of the program to find out if you are the lucky winners. Enough on the wonderful prizes. Ladies and gentlemen, to pray for blessings and smooth running for this event, I would like to invite Ahmad Zulfakri for the recital of du'a. Al-Fatiha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Ar-Rahmanirrahim. Malik Yawmiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim. Ghayri al-magdubi alayhim. Walad-dallin. Amin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ya Allah. We express our gratitude to you for allowing us to attend this colloquium on this auspicious morning. Oh Allah, we ask you for the safety of our religion and the welfare of our body. Oh Allah, Lord of the implementing authority, make the days that we have gone through, starting with your mercy, 
continue with your blessing and end it with your forgiveness and also make the days that we have gone through with guidance and end with the victory of excellence. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, let our efforts as a means to enlighten and convince ourselves that the personal safety of either outer or inner is a prerequisite for achieving happiness and excellence in various fields. O oh Allah, grant us faith and strength in order to face the challenges of life during the transition period and in the face of life in this new era. Ya Zal Jalali Wal Ikram, Ya Allah, show us guidance and adjust our path and ways to achieve happiness and glory. Let us listen to people who like the good things. Let us avoid doing the bad thing and evil things. O oh Allah, bless our life in this meeting and gathering and prevent us from harm and unfortunate events. Allahumma ja'al jam'ana hadha jam'an marhuma wa tafarruqna min ba'dihi tafarruqan ma'suma wa la taj'al illahuma fina wa la ma'ana wa la man yatba'una shaqiyan wa la matruda wa la mahruma. اللهم اجعل خير أعمارنا آخره وخير أعمالنا خواتمه وخير أيامنا يوم القاك فيه اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة هسنة واقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين Amin Amin Ya Rabbal Alamin May Allah make this event a success Thank you Ahmad Zulfakri for this du'a recitation now, I would like to invite the head of the project, Ms. Norain Shafika, to give a welcoming speech. Let's give her a big round of applause. To all tennis, Assalamualaikum, salam sejahtera Salam UITM di hatiku To our guest of honor, head of center of Miss Media Puan Zalifa Abdul Wahab To all deputy deans, head of centers, program coordinators Professors, lecturers from University Teknologi Mara, UITM, also other universities that joining us today. 
Our sponsors from Lubang Skin Care, Empayau Pondo Atuk and Sugar Bowl. Students from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia UPI, Presiden University, UCSI University, University Kebangsaan Malaysia UKM, University Teknologi Mara UITM, also students from other universities that joining us today as well. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, my friends and I would like to thank all our panelists who are willing to spend their time to share their expertise to us journalism students who are still forming our own set of skills for the next step in this journey. I also offer my highest gratitude to the faculty for giving us the opportunity to execute an event that opens up necessary dialogue about the current state of journalism, which in turn will be beneficial for us all in the future. We also want to thank our journalism project lecturer, Madam Azlinawati Ngainon, for her unwavering guidance and support throughout every single step we take in making this event a success. My fellow lecturers and friends, the Journalism e Colloquium June 2021 is set on the objective to spread digital safety awareness aiming to build a secure online environment by sharing precautions that can be taken by fellow journalists in every nook and cranny of the world. Not only that, but it also serves as a guidance for us journalism students and future media practitioners when we plan to go into the industry. During the planning stage of the colloquium, we were given an empty foundation that depended on our existing skills as students to engage in different types of roles and build network with different people and organizations such as Global Skin Care, Empire Pondo Ato and Sugar Bomb, who agreed to be our main sponsors and collaborated with us since our first pre-event. To this, we offer them our sincere gratitude. To say that my team has done a good job is an understatement. All of us have worked equally hard, especially under these conditions, and I believe that my team have exceeded expectation with the amount of work they have done to make this event possible. With that note, we hope that everyone in this Cisco Webex room and streaming on YouTube enjoys our colloquium and departs from the event with new insights and knowledge that will be beneficial in the future. Thank you. Now I would like to give a warm welcome to the head of the Centre of Mass Media, Mrs. Zalifa Abdul Wahab, to give an officiating speech. Another round of applause for Mrs. Zalifa Abdul Wahab. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Can you hear me? Okay, Assalamualaikum and uh, Salam Sejahtera. Um, good morning and Salam UITM di hatiku to our Miss Halina, the MC, thank you. To our honourable guests, uh, Dr. Kavika Muti, Chief Strategy Officer from Interlice Tech Services. Mr. Ramani Parkunan, editor at Asia News Today Network, Ms. Fabriana Friedaus, an independent investigative journalist from Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, the deputy deans, uh, all professors, head of centers, uh, course coordinators, 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the Faculty of Mass Communication and Mass Media, and all my dear students uh, from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, uh, President University, and UITM. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, today I represent on behalf of uh, the Dean, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Masila Hamza, as she is unable to attend uh, today's program. I'm ecstatic to be here today to participate in such a remarkable occasion, and I'd like to congratulate the journalism program, particularly the semester five students headed by Ms. Noor Ain Shafika in conducting a virtual journalism colloquium this year. Congratulations. Living in the digital age has brought many new challenges to journalism and news industry. Adapting to the new era while effectively delivering news to the public could be a life-changing event for journalists as they face unsettling threats every day. Journalists are often at risk of being targeted by malicious bodies that want to steal or kill secret information. Even so, the profession requires them to reveal sensitive stories that could endanger their personal lives. Unknown state-sponsored hackers and cyber criminals may break into the digital systems to gain access to their account, falsify data and evidence, steal and even leak their personal information. The theme for this year's e-colloquium is the digital safety for journalists combating the rising threats, an awareness program that highlights some of the digital threats that jeopardize journalism safety in this digital revolution. The main focus is to construct a framework to help journalists in developing digital safety. Many journalists are still unaware of the existence of government agencies or private foundations that are ready and able to help them in the event of digital attack. Thus, we believe that this program will be beneficial to them in helping to protect their personal data and internal databases. Journalism is a prestigious profession that eliminates the truth. Several leading journalists and news reporters have assessed to and delivered vulnerable information that could have far-reaching implications in the global socio-political landscape. This means that journalists are always at risk of being assaulted by someone who wants to steal or destroy information. By following best practices and taking all precautions before surfing the widespread internet, journalists can gain a safe path to the information channel without the fear of unexpected intrusion attacks. There are many compelling reasons for journalists to educate themselves about cybersecurity and consider investing in some security tools. When uh, journalists are concerned about cybersecurity and take protective steps, they are not only protecting their own personal information and that of their news organization, but they are also defending the independence and integrity of the press. With each new technology that enters the market, the potential for cybersecurity attacks grows. As we remember, journalism must be aware of the dangers and vulnerabilities associated with any software, application, or gadget they use, and take precautions to reduce the chance of a data breach. Ladies and gentlemen, journalists may minimize their susceptibility and safeguard 
their digital security by following a few brilliantly simple precautions. And it is important that the students acknowledge their role as soon-to-be media practitioners. They strive to spread digital safety awareness to build a secure online environment by sharing precautions that fellow journalists can take in every nook and cranny of the world. To my beloved students, let's start the program in the hope of combating the growth of cyber attacks from infiltrating reporters' digital data and information. I believe journalism is an important industry. And despite it carries its own set of risks, we have pulled the data to find the finest speakers who can lead the conversation on cybersecurity. On that note, with Lafaz Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I hereby officiate the Journalism Colloquium 2021. Thank you. Congratulations. Jenayah cyber menyebabkan Malaysia kerugian RM2 bilion ringgit. Menurut laporan Ancaman Keselamatan Sofos 2014, sebuah agensi bebas menyelidik tahap bahaya serangan cyber Malaysia berada pada tangga ke-6 mudah diserang penyenayah cyber. Mid-2020, a mobile phone belonging to Al Jazeera Arabic was hacked. The team from Al Jazeera unpicked an extraordinary story of some of the most advanced spyware in the world and how it's used, not least on Al Jazeera's journalists. Menurut laporan risiko global yang dikeluarkan oleh Forum Ekonomi Dunia, ancaman keselamatan cyber merupakan salah satu daripada lima risiko global terbesar di dunia. Ini menunjukkan bahawa masih terdapat kelemahan dalam sistem yang sedia ada seiring dengan tren baru seperti Internet of Things dan Big Data.
Wow, what a surprising and stunning montage. Also, thank you Mrs. Zalifa for the officiating speech earlier. So now introducing our sponsors. For our first sponsor, for our first sponsor we have Bluebell Skincare. Bluebell offers skincare that is not only effective but also harmless to our body and skin. The natural ingredients help you to become the best version of yourself, giving your face a healthy glow. You can also check out and follow their official Instagram at Bluebell Skincare Official. For the next sponsor, we have Sugar Bomb. I bet you guys are familiar with this brand. Their billboards are everywhere, right? Sugar Bomb is famous for their tagline, Duduk Rumah Pun Wangi. Sugar Bomb is specialized in formulating and selling long-lasting fragrances with internationally approved ingredients. Do follow and visit their official Instagram at SugarBombHQ for a variety of perfumes and air refreshers. And lastly, our third sponsor is Empire Pondo Ato. Pondo Ato offers a variety of products under one company where they sell famous local products such as Susu Nilofa, Ink's Popcorn, Real Keys, and many more. For this event, they have sponsored us with Crunchy Caramel Popcorn by Ink's Popcorn, Kacang Wanis by Wanis Snacks HQ, and Susu Nilofa by Nilofa HQ. Check them out now on Instagram at Empire Pondo Ato and make sure to follow them.
In a few minutes, we will start with our first session entitled Cybersecurity in the Front Line of Journalists. This topic will be presented by Dr. Kavita Muti, a Chief Strategy Officer at Interlice Tech Services. She is also the first woman in Malaysia to achieve a Master of Business Continuity Professional and is awarded with Best Certified Continuity Professional. Dr. Kavita is also the CyberSafe Ambassador for Cybersecurity in Malaysia and has won the CyberSafe Professional of the Year. She is also awarded with Top 10 Women in Security in Malaysia. In this digital era, cybersecurity should be in the front mind of journalists as adapting to the new era while effectively delivering news to the public could be a life-changing event for journalists as they face unsettling threats every day. This issue needs to be discussed further, so now we welcome Dr. Kavita Muti to the stage. Let's give her a big round of applause. Hello, Dr. Kavita, are you with us? Hi, Helena. Can you hear me? Yes, no. yes. Yeah. Dr. Kavita, I can hear you. All right. I was just worried. I think it's probably my speaker. Um, in case uh, if you yeah. lost me, then just uh, let me know. So I have to okay. adjust the speaker okay. in case okay. if it is dropping. Right. Thank you very much for that beautiful introduction, Helena. And once again, I'm very happy to be on this platform together with all the future journalists. Great. Um, very nice to see all of you again, and uh, I'm very honored to be in this session, especially uh, seeing the most upcoming uh, journalists and also leaders. And because of you, you're going to make this whole world more lively because journalists' uh, duty is very, very important. Without you, we got no news, right? So, and that makes all of us to be. Uh, so much so dependent on you and uh, dependent on how much you're going to say, what you're going to say. And today's world, keeping all of us to be so well connected. And then we also rely so much on the technology and the news that is being driven by the technology, right? Uh, so once again, uh, congratulations to uh, the members of uh, UITM. Well done. Uh, very beautiful event that you guys have actually. Uh, put up, uh, you know, today, this show. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, talking about this building digital safety for journalism, it's, um, um, you know, it, I, we wanted to say, I think I mentioned this to the organizer yesterday, let's have a hashtag of uh, journal safe, <laughs> right? So I'm going to share my slide. Um, Helena, just have to let me know if you're able to see them. Are you able to see the slide? Yes, I can see yes, the slide, Dr. Kavita. Very good. Awesome, right. I can see the thumbs up, thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, today uh, in this event, which is very much bringing up uh, or bringing us uh, to the most hot topic to be discussed about, it's digital safety. And uh, with in every one of us are so devastated with the biggest impact that we are facing due to the pandemic. And then since 2020 and more than one and a half years now, we are all stuck there. We are not moving anywhere. And again, we are locked down on MCO 3.0, and that is actually causing a lot of depression and emotional disruption for many of us. But here, 
what actually goes on is the news. What actually never dies off is the news, right? Tomorrow's news is today's um, effort that you guys put in. So we ma we all very much depend on you, whether the news is conventional, commercial, or whichever way traditionally it's supposed to be coming out in the news paper in a you know in a uh, in a digital media platform and all that but we rely so much so on the news so but what is it more important that we wanted to discuss today is this digital safety for journalists this is not only we talk about the safety for the computer user or the internet user but this is also for anyone and everyone that touches the keyboard and also the touch screen nowadays, right? As long as you're connected, you need to ensure that you are safe, regardless what position you are, regardless what status you are, regardless of what level you are, right? So as long as you are connected and you touch a computer, then you need to ensure that you are safe. Safe from what? Safe from any sort of cyber threat. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here in your event. Hello and everyone. I'm Dr. Kavita Muti, the Chief Intel um, Chief Strategy Officer of Intellis Tech Services. I'm so happy to be with all of you today. I think the hosts have given a beautiful introduction about me, and let's keep this and move on to our topic of the day. If we talk about digital, digital security, now we need to understand what is this digital security all about. Now we are coming to a level of no longer handling data. Data is very intangible, right? But though it can be intangible, it brings a lot of value, a critical value. It's a biggest asset to anyone, to an individual, to a business, to our country, right? So you need to have those data always be protected. Now, the collective term that describe the resources which are employed to protect your online identity, the data that you're sharing, and other assets that comes being saved or being stored in your computer is the digital that we're talking about. But however, whatever manner that you protect your things in the house, ensuring that it is locked, uh, ensuring it is prevented from being uh, still, ensuring that it is protected from being robbed. Similarly, you need to have that on your computer. So long your computer have a web services, your computer is actually being connected to an internet, storing your pictures, storing your stories, storing your information, storing your documents, your files, and whatever it is. And it bring it must have a sort of antiviruses, protect your phones, your cards, your biometric services, and also your personal information. So all these are relating back to the digital security. Now, it also provides the ability to spot, to react, and also recover from short-term disruptive challenges. What kind of disruptive challenges that you are facing about? I'm going to share to you later more in detail about it because it is an evolving response that you comes with the significant changes as a user. Now, it also involves protecting your online presence. Like I mentioned, when you are connected and you know you are doing some transaction, you are doing some research, you are doing some sharing of information. Now, your online presence, which comes with this data, your identity and the assets need to be protected. Now, that is in a nutshell to understand what is digital security. Now, what are we talking about? Uh, or, or rather, what are we supposed to understand about those emerging threats? We've been talking about digital security. Now that I understand the contextual about digital, so how do I prevent myself being a victim of this uh, cyber threat? So what are the cyber threats that I should be concerned about? And what are those emerging cyber threats that I should really making myself aware? Cyber threats, it is also referred as a possible successful attack that aim to gain an access to that computer that we talked about earlier, to that devices that we talked about earlier, just with a motive or an intention to damage it, to disrupt it, or to even steal it, those information assets, right? And from your computer, from an intellectual property, and from 
other form of uh, sensitive data. So all this, why? Because the predator who going to attempt, who are going to commit to do that, actually will benefit in somehow or other. Now, cyber threats can also come from within an organization by a trusted user. That would be surprised, right? We trust our employees so much. We trust our uh, peers so much, our subordinates, our colleagues and all that. But without us realizing that there are so many internal threats, the insider's threats are more higher than the external threats. And there's actually so many other facts that contributes to this kind of weaknesses within the organization that relating back to the human. Now, the one point that I wanted to emphasize here is cybersecurity is just not about having your hardware, your software is protected. But if you look at those IT professionals who's working 24 seven in organization, their job is just to ensure putting up all sort of elements and protected and multiple level of security being applied in those devices, those network, those infrastructure and all that. But again, some of those in organization, in fact, it, is, it can be small, medium or large enterprises are still facing security issues. Now, why would that be? Every one of us, even all the security professionals around the globe, I've already committed and saying that, admitted and saying that it is the human that becoming the weakest link of the security chain. Now, that is a known factor and well, it has been accepted and researched very well. So saying if it is coming from the human perspective, so what are the other type of cyber threats that come from and where do they come from? And how do I know that it is a cyber threat? I'll give you a couple of examples on that. Where are these cyber threats are actually coming from? And that could be a couple of things that you may want to write it down because it's going to make you do an interesting research at the moment. Now, it's begin with or it probably come with the hostile nations uh, uh, state. For example, the National Cyber Warfare Program that provide an emerging threats ranging from, it can be propaganda, it can be website defacement, it can be an espionage or a disruption of key infrastructure to lost life. Now, if you all know that there's critical national information infrastructure and all those agencies that falls under the CNII, are those agency contributes and you know on a day to day driving our economy and ensuring the people are uh, living and you know uh, living safely and whatever essential services is required uh, they are being given to them so one good example that i might also share at this point of time when your nco 3.0 is happening now, what the government have actually urged as those essential services or the critical services are deemed important in contributing the day-to-day -day living of a people are the one that's supposed to be operating. How do I define those critical or the essential services? Now, if you look at the critical national information services or the information infrastructure framework, there are a couple of sectors that's supposed to be very critical and contribute directly to the livelihood of the people of the Rakyat. And those are like agriculture, medical, transportation, energy, and all this, right? So, and if anything were to happen to this kind of this services and being disrupted, which can actually hostile the whole nation and the state and could cause a disruption. So that is part of cyber threat. Also, it comes from them. So the government sponsored programs are also increasingly becoming sophisticated and it poses an advanced threat when compared to other threat actors. So the second uh, way of where do you really see them is the terrorist group. Now we talk about terrorist attack, but many of us have actually probably forgotten the word of cyber terrorists, right? Now, these are the charities group that increasingly using cyber platform, your technology, right, to attack and to damage the national interest. At one click away, they could actually bring down the whole national um, energy supply to the country. 
We are no longer talking about a health gun being brought in a large group of army and come and attack the country. But I don't have to do that if I have a group of people sitting elsewhere in the other part of the world, just with a click away, they bring down the country. Now, they are less developed in cyber attack and they have lower propensity to pursue the cyber means that they may not have a very high technical skill, but it's just this cyber, uh, the terrorist group would present a substantial cyber threat as more technically competent generation join their ranks, right? So they can be anywhere, sitting from anywhere, and with just one click away, they would be probably bringing down the countries. And they, we are exposed to that level of uh, danger uh, to this kind of terrorist group. On the other hand, at the uh, corporate spies and also the organized crime organization, that those corporate spies and organized crime organization, they pose a very high risk because their ability to conduct industrial espionage is still trade secret. And to tell you honestly, there are people who are highly paid to become the espionage just for them to spy on the trade secret and to go and sell it over. So this profit-based activities is probably making a large profit for those businesses, uh, for those people who are selling the business information, and it causes a great loss for the business owner because it gives a large scale of disruption by this kind of attack. It can actually bring the whole infrastructure to loss, and also they can loss against a competitor, and their information, all the trade secrets are being revealed, and people can access to those information and blackmail, use that as a potential blackmail to make money. On the other hand is the activities. I think activities, right? Those activities, um, activities are ranged across political ideas um, or also issues. Probably you guys heard about the cyber troopers. That is slightly different than this hacktivist, right? Now, most hacktivist groups are concerned with uh, spreading propaganda, or rather they can, uh, you know, cause a certain level of damages to the infrastructure and also disrupt the services by just creating this propaganda. Now, their real goal would be to support their political agenda rather than uh, maximum damage to an organization. They just wanted to create the havoc within the organization, or it could also be in the country. And uh, those propaganda can actually give them, um, uh, the, the motive of the propaganda is actually to create conflicts, confusion, and make situation more complex. On the other hand, or, or also as part of those where those threats are coming from, another level would be the hackers. Now, everyone is very familiar with the word of hackers, right? This malicious intruders could actually take, um, you know, probably an advantage of a zero-day exploit. Uh, why do they want to do that? Because they want to gain access to the data. And these people, they also have the ability to break to any system to gain information and also to, you know, uh, steal this data and make a high use of it. You'll be surprised to know that those hackers nowadays are not technically a degree holder or master's holder in IT, right? They do not come with a special IT skill to do that. They are so interestingly becoming a hacker by just Googling it, right? So your Mr. Google or Mr. YouTube would actually educate those people to become the hacker. So in today, in so much so automated attack scripts and protocols can actually be downloaded so easily from the internet and make sophisticated attack become so simple, right? Now, then you also have those disgruntled insider. I mentioned earlier that the insider's attack is more higher compared to those external threats. Those disgruntled uh, insiders are the common source of a cybercrime. And those insiders are often do not need a high knowledge of computer uh, uh, knowledge uh, because they can also do certain things accidentally, but with a motive also can be done. And this actually exposed to so much so sensitive data, uh, data, right? These are the employees, these are the insiders. Who are those insiders we are talking about? I'll explain to you. You can take them like the employees, those vendors 
those visitors, right? The common visitors that actually comes for the meeting and have an access to the building and stuff like that. So these insiders are actually can make certain action accidentally. I give you an example. If you go to the toilet and you found a thumb drive drop there, and you being a nice Malaysian, you were first thing first, you want to take the thumb drive. Secondly, you are not so nice to go and give the thumb drive to go and look for the people who owns the thumb drive and make a you know a, a call hey who owns this thumb drive yeah come and get it from me i found it in the toilet you're not going to do that right the first thing first you're going to do is plug it in to your computer to see what it carries interestingly it actually will transfer any viruses or trojans or whatever that has been capped in those thumb drive to be spread over to if in fact your computer right no not many people knows about it so i am actually the insider i brought this threat to my organization unknowingly okay now the natural disaster also could actually cause a disruption to a network to an infrastructure of an organization that could also expose to some sort of cyber attack. And accidental action of authorized users. This is very interesting. You'd be surprised to know that all organization companies at all large scale or whatever small scale or medium scale, they have authorized users for their data to their file, to their network and all that. Now, these are the authorized users may forget to correctly configure certain security um, uh, security posture, you know, causing a potential data leak in the uh, data leak. Um, that had happened before, right? Uh, if you look, one of the organization who have actually accidentally shared a file to a people that it carries all classified information about the donors. So, or the organ donors, right? So that kind of information, that kind of uh, accidental uh, action of those authorized users can also be, uh, um, you know, a threat, uh, a cyber threat to anyone. Now, some of the biggest data breaches have been caused by poor configuration rather than uh, the hackers disgruntled insiders. Or um, it is simply because human, I say, um, a normal user that have an access to the those data and then they accidentally share those files or probably they clicked on a phishing link that you know inviting um, a threat to their own organization and also expose their data and also information so well this is a really happening uh, example of uh, those threats where are they really coming from so on the um, knowing and understanding about where these threats are coming from. Now, the next question that you probably would be interested to know is what are those threats? What am I preventing myself from? What am I supposed to uh, taking care or protecting uh, from? Now, I did mention that. OK, I just hang on. OK, I did mention that. Um, the type of uh, attack, the threats, right? Where are they coming from? So where are they coming from? What are they bringing in? It's the malware attack, uh, the phishing attack, or the man in the middle attack, or kind of Trojans, the ransomware, or DDoS, or data breaches. Take a deep look at it. The malware is actually a software platform uh, of a malicious task that it can go into a specific target devices or a network and disrupt uh, the data and also a system. And phishing or the spear phishing, it's very commonly happening now. You probably receive an email saying that this, hi, I'm actually from this XYZ bank. I would like you to update your data as I'm clean. We are cleaning up our system. And your data is very important for sure for us to ensure that you receive the right information at the right point of a time and we care you as our customer. So you are so um, touched thinking that the XYZ bank cares for you. 
and you will have to click on the link and it leads you to another page and you start keying in all those information related to your card, to your account number, to your IC number, and to the rest of the uh, personal information. Now, uh, this actually leads to uh, downloaded malware um, with the hyperlink that has been given, and those malware can actually come and do all kind of work in your computer. Now, uh, the spear phishing, it is a little bit more sophisticated uh, form of a phishing where attackers actually learn about the victim and impersonate someone uh, about he or she knows the trust, right? So the man in the middle attack is actually where you are connected and that uh, you are uh, the recipient and you have a receiver um, from this electronic messages. And there is someone in the middle that intercept and perhaps wanted to change information before it runs it. That is the MITM. Trojan, typically a malware as well, that it enters to your targeted system and it, for example, a standard piece of software that lets out all malicious code once inside the host and start making changes to the system. Ransomware, once upon a time, it was really, really famous. It is still famous. It was famous long time ago. And this ransomware attack, it actually goes right to the target. They encrypt and they ask for ransom for them to release the system or your data again but you are not given a 100% assurance that once they release the data, your data will still be clean and as what the original is supposed to be. The denial of service or the dis, uh, denial of service or the distributed denial of service attack here, yeah, DDoS. This is where an attacker actually uh, take over uh, perhaps thousands of devices at one point of a time and use them to invoke the function of a target system, for example, like a website, causing it crashed uh, from an overloaded uh, overload of a demand. So that is a DDoS attack, a very common attack and a very famous attack. Uh, data breaches can come from any sort of a, um, a platform, yeah, from the data leakage or uh, stealing of the data and all that. It also, a data breach happens due to a data theft uh, by a malicious actor, someone who comes to your organization. This is very easily can be obtained with this activity called social engineering. Now, you might be very interested to know about social engineering. Social engineering be just as simple as me talking to you, gaining your personal information and use those information to gain access to probably your data, or if you are a receptionist, or if you are a secretary of a company, and I start a conversation with them, and then psychologically drive them to be more vulnerable, to open up all information that I wanted to get, and I use them to actually gain access to the data and do whatever that I wanted with the motive, right? So that sort of data breaches actors, the malicious actors now. Motive of data breaches, including crime, like identity theft, for example, a desire to embarrass an institution. You know, I, I've given some example, but um, that there are more other example that is already happening in Malaysia as well. So you can take a look at it. Right. Um, so what all this uh, has got to do with us and those technological advancements? Uh, which actually opens uh, new avenues for threats. And uh, the potential for cybersecurity threats actually evolved, right? Because we see that as technologies developed, um, there are so many opportunities as well as threats uh, to journalists, not only to journalists, to all of us, to anyone. But the answer is not to be paralyzed by this digital transformation, uh, but to also um, to be more um, careful to be more alert and be aware of what is happening around us. So those technological advancements, uh, which actually opens new avenues for threats, are the potential threats which involve or evolve with every new technology that hits in the market. You will be also surprised to know that as new technology come, thousands of um, weaknesses or vulnerabilities bond together and the hackers will actually create tools 
for every minute there are hundreds of tools are being developed and born on daily basis so hackers have already figured out in fact uh, those new technology comes in right what kind of method can i use to undermine the newly launched technology before you even launch the technology probably they are already launching the attack at the back the hackers are the both individual actors and also the state sponsored variety are uh, increasingly they are also aware of those potential access points you might be surprised to know that hey if you build a house i give you an example if you build a house and you are actually ensuring that your back door is locked, your back gate is locked, your windows are locked, your front door is locked, yeah? But you don't know that the robber who have been watching you building the house probably already know other way of accessing entry to your house. Now, that's the same thing what the hacker do to have a potential access point to your system. So what journalists need to be aware of those risks and vulnerabilities that actually comes from any sort of application that you use or any sort of devices that you use and what are the steps that you need to take to mitigate those risks of a breach, right? So um, actually this is a very key point uh, to building a safety uh, producers of journalism and also your sources that you are getting. And it is also crucial to preserve an independent and free media's functions in a democracy society. I'll give you an example of uh, why, uh, why this becoming so crucial and why do journalists need to prioritize cybersecurity. If you still remember the story, Last year, where the exiled Pakistani journalist Sajid Hussein was found dead in Sweden. His case highlighted the risk to reporters who undermine hostile regimes and the very nature of the job puts journalists at the forefront of unending scrutiny and surveillance. Such cases are becoming all too common nowadays. Another one, the tragic of a tale of uh, an Italian student, Giulio Regini, conducting research on the controversial topic of independent trade unions in Cairo, Egypt. And Regini was abducted and subsequently was tortured till that. This happened in 2016. So many commented disbelieved that Egyptian security services were involved in his death. And that happened because Regini was involved in doing some research and he was exposed to a lots of lots of sensitive information that probably those people do not want those information to be coming out. So it's supposed to be subsided, it's supposed to be buried. But when somebody go and dig it, drill it, and when it's coming out, then you are in danger, right? So the reality is uh, a record uh, number of journalists were killed uh, in Mexico. Reporters were imprisoned in Myanmar and also journalists in Turkey faced criminal charges in mass. Uh, you can actually get this from the uh, journalist um, g.org, those informations. That shows that we, we are exposed to all kind of danger, regardless of whether you are connected. And but this journalists have always been exposed to many kind of danger. Uh, traditionally, uh, those days from many many years, because of the research that you're doing, because of the information that you're gathering, because of the data that you're handling, right? So one thing that you forget is your security level and you think when you are safe in the eye of the public you are also safe in the eye of the cyber safe it is it's not when you have the free when you are speaking the censored matter you are no longer safe in the public and also in cyberspace
the psychological challenges that actually affecting the journalists. There are many. For an example that I would like to share with you when I speak to one, one of the journalists or some of the cases that I, that I handle, and these are, you'll be surprised, they are anchors, they are newscasters, they are reporters that usually come and cry over, look, I have said this thing, but I've been trolled in social media for me to saying this, for me to quoting this. So I don't have the freedom to say what am I supposed to say or how is it supposed to be said, right? And there is a, when that sort of impact goes to this person uh, and it has been trolled, it has gone viral and they become so insecure, they become so depressed, they become so confused and emotionally disrupted. Not only common people like us have this sort of uh, emotional uh, ruling in our body, but in our mental, physically, it is also the reporters, it is also the journalists, these are the media actors. There is a low level of appreciation and understanding of digital security principles and tools, right? And uh, there is also the decision fatigue among the journalists and other media actors that actually resulting in a weak application of digital security tools or a complete avoidance because of that. And uh, if you have some sort of lacking in digital uh, security, that could also open up vulnerability or exposing yourself to those vulnerability because you're not understanding uh, the digital platform, the level of security that is needed. How do you protect yourself? How do you be? Uh, how do you safeguard the information? How do you not reveal yourself too much when you're doing the research, right? Or when you're gathering information and all that. So the digital security training is often uh, not systemized or it is not holistic. Um, probably you are missing out things like operational security, network security, uh, email security, mobile security. And remember, uh, to all my journalist friends today, your mobile actually brings you to all kind of vulnerabilities. Some of us don't even have a, an antivirus in the mobile. Some of us don't even use a password to keep the mobile safe and protected or backed up, right? Uh, so this all can actually uh, cause you a greater loss when you become a cyber victim. And your training becomes so important, so and so important for you to educate yourself. And um, for those previous um, traumatic experience that may result for certain journalists, it also making bad decisions that lead to a greater insecurity state in yourself. And you also remember that some of those family uh, or maybe experience this, I believe, some of your family members, some of your friends may unintentionally compromise the digital security of you, uh, you know, doing journalism, uh, such as uh, by inadvertent disclosure on social media. They are proud to share uh, on what you're doing and they are not realizing the kind of, uh, you know, uh, danger that it could actually lead by sharing the information in social media. Now, once again, if you look at it, this is what I say about the insider threats. I'm not really talking about the insider threats that comes in an organization, but those insider threats that actually coming surrounding you, your family members or your friends. So be careful. It is not only you need to learn those security to keep yourself cyber safe, but it is also the people around you. So one, a couple of ways that I would like to share with all of you as those potential, the new journalists or whoever is watching this program today, uh, how can you protect yourself from this kind of cyber threats? Uh, there are a lot of guidelines that has been given or shared uh, for those media actors uh, that doing journalism uh, in, a, in, in many ways. And uh, I take the pride to share some of it. And this actually comes from the, um, how do you actually uh, build a safe 
safe uh, digital safety for journalism. Um, so what you are focusing is on your professions and your professions, um, it's a very fragile professions, I must say, because you are exposed to so many information, data that classified or for some information that you are not supposed to know. And hence, how do you protect yourself? How do you protect those information? Well, regardless whether you want to reveal, you want to write it or you do not want to write it, that is another point. But so long, I know that you have that information. Now you have to protect yourself and those cybersecurity need will come into place for you. Uh, and it begins with you and you know what to do. So you, pro, you have to follow the best practices and you need to take all the necessary precautions before voyaging in the vast extent of the internet. It is very nice to go from one browser to another, to another website, to another file and talking and sharing and capturing and snapping and all that. But you need to know the secure passage for those information channels that you are voyaging. And how can you protect yourself from becoming a victim or exposing yourself to those threats? Well, the threats are already there. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, you are already into the vulnerabilities. But you need to have this CUU, CUU, you create, you use, you utilize. Create a strong password. The authentication is most important aspect of privacy. And any malicious people can do anything to get to those credentials. And, you know, probably it comes from a social media or your website or your files and whatever not. Simply because of a weak password, this could actually bring you to an incredible level of uh, threat. So when your password is very simple, now you create a simple password because you do not want to forget them. Uh, you do not want to, uh, you know, have difficulties in remembering them, right? So that actually, uh, um, you know, easy to crack. And many people would use same password uh, for multiple type um, of their files, for multiple access. Uh, probably the same password has been used for Facebook, uh, been used for your computer, been used for your handphone or your bank account and whatever not. So this actually uh, loomed to a threat, um, or, or rather the threat becomes so intensified. So what do you have to do for that? Learn how to create a strong password, a unique password, a complex password, which actually comes uh, from a uh, combination of uh, symbols, numerics, alphabets, right? Use that kind of password and have some password managers in your device. And use the Tor browser. Now, this is uh, the infamous hub of the dark web. It's actually the best browser for anonymously serving the internet. The peer-to-peer -peer network actually uh, can transmit untraceable packet of data, which this will be encrypted, and um, each of the node of the network, does it actually guarantee anonymous anonymity. Uh, the lack of traceability also allows um, the illegal activities uh, to try to tour browser. However, it is still best uh, for you uh, to safely and anonymously exchange information with your sources and also clients. Uh, so Tor is another browser that you can uh, make use of it. If you want to learn more about it, uh, you can reach out uh, to the organizer um, I was actually talking to the organizer yesterday that you, how you can make things uh, more aware and use the best practices to protect yourself from those cyber threats. Another one is utilize the VPN, the virtual private network. Now, it's one of the best way to secure your online traffic since another IP mask your activity. So those VPN user, it is, you need to know that the VPN is used uh, for your own secure service in several uh, locations worldwide. 
but make sure that you purchase a paid version of those VPN, right? And uh, this secure channel not only protects users from uh, prying ears, but and also eyes like men in the middle. It prevents you from that. And also it unblocks geographically unrestricted and censored services and content. So whichever VPN serves you, connect you, uh, your IP is that um, hands uh, to your server. Hence it is uh, as if like you're located in that very country and it is protected. Uh, so essentially, uh, for all the journalists, uh, VPN becomes some of the popular uh, access, uh, which includes the Google Outline and also ExpressVPN. Uh, so these are the couple of things that you can learn and uh, adopt uh, to protect yourself online. However, remember, all this actually helps you to minimize the risk of you becoming a cyber victim, but it does not give you 100% security. It does not. That is no 100% security. These are tools I'm seeing. These are some practices that I'm asking you to adopt. But again, it is you yourself needs to ensure that your physical and your logical security is always, uh, you know, it become, uh, or rather I would say, embed that into the culture, your own culture. So it become a leading stone with you. Okay, so you have to write it in a diary, right? What you're supposed to do and not to do, what you're supposed to eat and not to eat. Like it's a dietary supplements. It's like you're you're on a diet. What you're supposed to eat? What time do you do your exercise and stuff like that? So same thing goes for your cyber safety or your digital security. Now there are sources that you must protect, and which it became a fundamental principle. The journalists must keep a long list. I know that you guys will keep a long list of anonymous sources and relationship with many people in the know, and they actually exposed to a security situation. And the honest is always on the journalist to protect your identity of your safety sources, whether it can be ethics or legality. Both the sources have a certain level of trust and the journalists that you maintain contact with and a trust. If a trust is broken, then the journalist's integrity is also compromised. So you regain the trust of anonymous lips, become harder, and you as a reporter, you will be struggling in rebuilding your own reputation. Hence, protecting your sources and the information is the key to a journalist's safety. Now that we have spoken so much of being secured, I've got this term today. I, I did say that uh, probably today we're going to have this hashtag journal safe, UITM, and be digital secured journalists. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who have been with me for this half an hour, I think how many minutes already? Right? I've got another 10 minutes. Now, you got to be mindful of not just the ever growing number of vulnerabilities, but it is also the cybersecurity threats that in the store. Like I say, when you are going, when you park your car, when you come out from the car, when you close the car, always look at left, right, back, front, who is there, because you want to prevent yourself from being snatched, right? Number two, when you're crossing the road, look at your left and your right and cross the road because you want to prevent from accidents, right? If you're leaving your house, ensuring that your back door, your window, your window door, main gate, everything is locked properly because you want to prevent your house being robbed. Same thing. That's exactly the same thing that what we are talking about in the world of digital. You need to transform yourself from that physical security to this logical security. Be mindful of those great growing numbers of vulnerabilities and the threats and how vulnerable you can be, right? So, and how, what are the steps you need to take to protect yourself? Now, and your sources, by keeping up to date on the latest technology, on the latest digital security news, threats, hacking, phishing, surveillance, and whatnot. Go and learn all that important for all of you. As much as your writing is important, as much as your information gathering and the data mining is important, you need to keep yourself protected.
Now you must realize that there is a need to keep up to date and to understand the strength and the weaknesses a browser or an email provider or the social media platform, your messaging application, your software, your hardware. How do you protect them? How do you keep them safe? How do you prevent yourself from being a victim in all this platform? All right, so you need to get that as well. Think about the information that you are responsible for. Remember, you are doing your research, you're gathering information, you're pulling data, sensitive information, sensitive data, classified, and how do you protect them? You are responsible for that. You are responsible for your own security. And what could happen if it falls to the wrong hands? And what kind of measures that you need to take to defend on the account, your devices, your communication, and your online activity. Have secure communication at all time. And understand that as a digital citizen, you are also the digital citizen. You are also the digital journalist. So be secure. Understand that digital and physical security are linked and take steps to improve both. I mentioned about if you want to prevent yourself from snatched, if you want to prevent yourself from being kidnapped, if you want to prevent your house from being robbed, if you want to prevent yourself from road accidents, then those physical security has always got connection with your digital security. If you don't want your laptop to be still, you must know how to protect your devices. If you do not want men in the middle attack, then make sure a secure wireless connection with a VPN connection is used. If you do not want anyone to intercept or know what you are sending and taking up, make sure your documents are encrypted. Use a safe password and you know a secure platform. So the threat, digital hygiene as a habit and practice. Bring that as a culture to yourself. Threat digital hygiene as a habit and a practice. Embrace yourself against cyber threat. Brace yourself against those cyber threat. You must prioritize cyber security by setting up a security strategy, access and classify those data that you're handling. If you need to run an activity like auditing yourself, please do it regularly. You got to focus on cybersecurity awareness. Attend those training that is required to keep yourself appraised, understanding what are the late, latest, uh, you know, threats or uh, hacking tools or uh, vulnerabilities and, you know, how do you actually prevent yourself? And I remember that I used to organize uh, an event called Hacker Halted. It was organized by my ex company, which is known as EC Council. And we did a very large scale of conference and we have invited journalists like you to attend the Hacker Halted because journalists need to know in order for them to write about hackers, you need to know what hackers think, how do they behave, what do they do and stuff like that, right? Um, I wish I have all this event coming back after NCO 3.0 or, or no NCO and all of you are vaccinated. Let's have this conference again, only for journalists, right? So that you can learn what the hackers is thinking. Now, create a unique and a strong password. I taught you how you're supposed to be creating those combination of uh, um, a complement which comes with the two-factor authentication and also invest in cybersecurity tools. I think uh, one of our speaker later probably will be talking about some tools uh, which can actually uh, help you to protect yourself. But in general, like antivirus, fire. and some privacy tools and certain threats please and um, hack yourself this will happen you identify the one you know there is a vulnerability you try to i know understand what kind of vulnerabilities and um um uh, Hackers, right? Uh, those desks uh, and just and 
to practice and see with the help of those professionals, right? And then Sorry, Dr. Kavita, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, guys. I thought I just lost you guys. So I'm back again. <laughs> That's what happened. So much so All dependent right. on technology. I have ended my presentation and I am happy to open the floor for questions now with the moderator. Oh, um, Dr. Kavita, you would you want to continue your previous part earlier? Which one was that? Or are uh, you done? I'm done. Actually. The last part. Yes. Oh, OK. OK. All right. Okay. Um, so we have come to the end of Dr. Kavita's sharing session. Um, it's really an eye opening and insightful sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Kavita Muti, for joining us today and addressing this compelling topic. But do not leave yet because right now we are having a Q&A session with the participants. Also, please take note that question submissions are now closed for this session. Thank you. Halina, I think someone was asking about the last slide that I presented. Yeah. yeah. Would you want to repeat the last slide? Can I do that? <laughs> okay. Because we're kind of having some technical difficulties here. Yes, sure. Right. Um, well, before I end my session, I actually said that as a continuation for uh, for digital secured journalists, so one of the things that I was actually saying about the bracing yourself against those cyber threats, and one of the priorities that you have to take uh, into uh, calculation or writing it in your diary right now, if you're putting it as part of your tips, those cybersecurity uh, strategy that you need to access and have certain document and how do you classify those data? Like all of us know that uh, data gathering, um, analyzing information are very crucial activity as part of your journalist task. And uh, those informations need to be gathered and also kept safe because you are gathering information and data that can be very sensitive that can be very, very um, uh, probably classified. Probably you are also getting information which you are not supposed to get to know. So you need to uh, handle those data uh, in a more appropriate manner and also not 
think about your responsibilities to protect them. You do not want those information to go to a wrong hand just because of your negligence. So that part is your responsibility. And also fo focus on cybersecurity awareness. I think I've been saying this repeatedly, right? And there are training which is available for you to know how you can sec uh, communicate securely, how you can have your mobile uh, being secured, how is your email security, uh, your operation system security, you know, all that, your network connections, your wireless connection, and all that sort of things. Um, we did spoke about um, creating a unique password and also having those uh, backups. Uh, there's two things important. Uh, password, you need to have a unique creation of this password. And uh, if you possible, use some password manager to support you on that and also backup, right? Regularly backup your documents. If it's possible, uh, you need to um, also invest in certain tools like your antivirus, your firewall, uh, and also some other privacy tools that automatically can actually scan your threats and your devices. Uh, and uh, I did mention about hack yourself. If you think you wanted to get some of those professional experts to crack your passwords, to see how secure is your file, you can work collaboratively uh, with them. That can be happen when you're attending your trainings and all that. Uh, so this is how certain tips I said to brace yourself against a cyber threat. I hope that I covered my last si slide again. <laughs> and yeah, so we can move on to the uh, Q&A now. Fake news, right? I, I, my, yeah, I can see all those questions are flowing up already. <laughs> we'll move to the Q and A session shortly. Yes, yes, definitely, sure. All right. Okay. We'll move on to the Q and A session. As we can see, there there are lots of questions in the chat box, so I'm not going to waste any time. Um, the first question, Dr. Kavita. Um, we have um a question from Amirul Amin from UTEM, where the question is that um he said, I remembered about two years back, CIMB Berhad were almost were almost whole CIMB consumer account had been hacked and almost half of the money in the account is missing and that was a very alarming uh, issue for the security system and the question is that what what do you think in that time with the security system when CIMB said that they state that they are not under attack and compare it with today's system where someone said because CIMB app has been hacked where someone says the website is not secure. So in this situation, is it the consumer's fault for having lack of precaution or it's actually the responsibility of um, the authorities themselves? Thank you. Very relevant question, uh, but again, I would like to emphasize that security does not only fall on the hand of the organization, but definitely it's on the hand of the consumer. So if you are not actually, uh, as a consumer, you also have responsibilities to ensure that you are not uh, connecting yourself to all those vulnerabilities, activities that probably like a phishing attack, right? You probably receive some emails from those banks and all that. So if you know that it is not a legitimate link that you should uh, get yourself connected, please prevent it. Again, <clears throat> Become a digital uh, citizen. It's your responsibilities to ensure, uh, uh, you know, you also comply to certain security policy. Now, talking from the organization perspective, you need to have the trust on the organization that you are working with. Because organization, they spend millions of dollars to prevent themselves from, uh, you know, for, to pr protect their data, to protect their network, to protect their information, their infrastructure, and they put multiple level of security inside. They also have people, skilled people, trained people to manage their network, to manage their infrastructure and their assets and their system. So I, I, I don't say that, oh, you don't have to worry at all, you know, but like your question, who's responsible is that? My answer to you is it's your responsibilities, anyone and everyone that uses the computer's responsibility. So, but again, security does not give you 100% assurance, but it minimizes the risk and also impact, right? So it's everybody's responsibilities. All right, thank All right. you, Dr. Kavita, meaning that it's actually 
um, the organization itself have the responsibility um, to manage and also as a consumer we also need to be aware of what we are doing right that's right absolutely right. exactly so for the second question um a question from nur balkis utem um the question is speaking of cyber troopers should we criminalize them Uh, Dr. Kavita, can you hear me? Yes, Halina, I can hear you. The question is, um, should we criminalize cyber troopers? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Cyber troopers are supposed to be criminalized and there is no any act or rather in cyber law to actually say that. Uh, neither it is uh, bounded to any sort of legalization in any part of the world. Cyber troopers just doing their creativity. Uh, action like you know creating attentions and uh, creating uh, newses and stuff like that so at this point of a time uh, there is no bound of uh, legality for the cyber troopers all right um, i'll move on to the third question uh, a question from azim omar from uitm shah alam um, he said that uh, as a student um, I think most, I think maybe half of students would actually do this where um, they use illegal websites uh, in completing their assignments, as in like using tools from illegal websites. So uh, in a way that it actually um, gives uh, risk for them when they use those kinds of websites. Um, so the question here says that um, sometimes there are they, they are willing to take extra length in entering malicious website so uh, they think that the information that are that they post on the website might be exposed and also as a student we are not really uh, well informed on the cyber safety of uh, as in when doing our assignments when um, going through websites in browsing information so um uh in a way that saying that the utility itself the utility tools on the internet um it's not necessarily secure so what is your advice for students that um that are actually using these tools okay um well, I, that, that was a very long statement, but if you could, if I could understand uh, what you're trying to say is you uh, when you do your research uh, or doing your assignments and all that, you actually browse through uh, many, many um, websites, correct? And uh, there's uh, plenty of information flooding everywhere. But how do you know that this information or this sources are legitimate? So my advice to you, if I were to be your lecturer here, I would only advise you because we are also educating children and the children are also uh, given a space to go and do their research. And that research is actually to enhance their knowledge, correct? To explore their experiences, right? And uh, same thing applies to all of you who is doing researches. And now uh, you need to know the information that you're getting is legitimate and the information is being got it from uh, the sites are also legitimate, right? If you know that it is not or try to know if it is yes or not a legitimate source that you're gathering the information, then prevent yourself from exposing yourself to that level. I know you're already exposed. Now the responsibilities come back to your hand. Do you want to do that? That is the reason why, you know, uh, there's a lot of surveillance happening around us and we don't know who is watching us. And if suddenly you go and take certain information from this black site and you think you are very happy, why? Well, it's a juicy information, yeah? It's a juicy news, right? You get very excited of writing it. But those civilian who's watching you may not be happy on what you're doing. That actually brings you another threat. And when you are you know, you are pulling all those informations and they can actually come with other sort of malicious to your own devices that could also disrupt. So here I'm talking about your life threat as well as the information that you're gathering could also cause disruption to your work. So my answer is a no, don't do that. All right, thank you, Dr. Kavita. 
Yes. Okay, I'll move on to the fourth question. Um, a question from Asir from U International University of Malaysia, Wales, where um, the question is, um, are Max also at risk for cyber attack, knowing that um, Apple products are always being more secure compared to other products? Well, I try not to be a uh, product um, <laughs> uh, focus here. Uh, for me, it can be any product. Uh, security is still need to be adopted, implemented, and uh, ensured. So I cannot say product A is good than product B. Product B is better than product C. No product will give you 100% assurance. All right, okay, uh, the next question we have is, uh, okay, there's a question from Faid from UITM Shah Alam. Um, I have a question for my final year project. Does clickbait articles contribute to the spread of malware, Trojan, or any other threats? What article? Clickbait article. I'm sorry, I'm not really aware about it. Uh, who is asking this question, please? Uh, a student. Uh, is this for your project? I, I'm not sure. The student is uh, our audience today. Okay. Would you mind to get the student to reach me out later? I would be able to advise him. Let me get more information on the question that he's asking. All right. Sure, sure. Okay, I'll okay. just move on to the next question. Um... Another question is from Zulaika, a semester five journalism student, UITM Shah Alam. And the question is, what are the cyber threats used by government to spy on journalists or gain access to their personal data? And how, are, how do those threats affect news publishing? <laughs> I'm not in a right, I, I, I don't think so. I'll be safe enough to say this today. <laughs> But I appreciate your enthusiasm. I appreciate your curiosity. This is very much on what government is using to spy on the uh, journalists. I think it's a very confidential matter or rather a very sensitive question to be answered in this platform. May I please request for the moderator for to skip this uh, question? All right, okay. sure, sure. Okay. Um... The next question I have here is, Um, a question from Umi, UITM Shah Alam student. Uh, since Malaysia is new to this cybersecurity issue, with using VPN and such, will the public be able to adapt with this rising uh, cybersecurity issues? Uh, so, okay, okay, Helena, can you please repeat the question again? The question is, uh, since Malaysia is new to the cybersecurity issue, with using VPN and such, um, will the public be able to adapt with the rising threats? Well, I, I would like to share my experience here. The cybersecurity issue is not new in Malaysia. It has been mm -hmm. there since the day I started uh, knowing what is cybersecurity. That was in year 2000. And the 9-11 attack, when the 9-11 attack happened, that actually became a, a great eye-opener to everybody. Because that's where they learn, oh my God, there is such thing called cyber terrorists, right? So, uh, and it has always been there to educate our people, just a matter of we are laid back, right? So this use of VPN only not going to help you to protect yourself from becoming a cyber victim, or rather for the people to think I'm safe. There's more to that. Network security is just one of it. Right, the rest of the thing when you're working remotely, when you're working from home and you're doing researches, you're gathering information, so you're exposed to all kind of other uh, vulnerabilities. So I think I did share uh, in my slide later. Helena, I appreciate if you could also share my slide to everybody. It's a very, um, uh, you know, uh, relevant information to their questions. All right, I will share the slides later. Sure. Okay, so um, the next question is, I think this is a question um, for your personal, from your personal experience. Okay. Um, have you 
Have you experienced any cyber attacks or Maybe any threats? <laughs> yeah. Lisa? Yeah, yeah, when I'm talking about cyber security, I am definitely a victim of a cyber threat. <laughs> Who can be saved from not being a, a victim? I was, my Facebook, my picture was taken and edited and exposed. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, with the help of my security experts in my company, I was able to uh, close those accounts immediately and retrieve it and clear the doubts of those my uh, or, or my followers. Uh, this is also my advice to journalists who is actually uh, actively involved in your social media that people can actually impersonate. Uh, you can also become um, a victim of a cyber bully and you can be trolled, uh, you know, your news can be viral. So, but you have to immediately take action. There are so many people who are emotionally drowned because of those uh, uh, sensitivity uh, threats that they are facing and becoming a victim and they are being trolled and viral and all that. So do not end your life because of that. There are so many of them, so many. They are the anchors, they are the newscasters. There are also some uh, journalists, reporters who have came to me and uh, we have been helping. First, first, when you know that you have become a victim, you need to understand and acknowledge yourself that you are facing a crisis. And do not drown yourself into the deep ocean of this um, crisis and you don't know how to come out of it. So once you realize, you acknowledge, and you go and make a police report, gather those information, evidence, bring those evidence, and go to Cybersecurity Malaysia, uh, Cyber Cyber 999, reach them out for further assistance, right? So um, there are agency that is willing and already there prepared to uh, help us at any point of time. They are easily reached out. You can go to NCMC if you think you already found the culprit and you want to execute, um, you know, you want to prosecute, you can always go to NCMC to take further action. Yeah. Yes, I am a cyber victim as well. I was. I was. <laughs> Once. All right. I think I have a last question here. Um, let me just check for a bit. All right, um, Dr. Kavita, the last question is from Zulaika, a semester five journalism student from UITM Sha'alam. Um, the question is, as we are aware, doxing is one of the cyber threats. So what are the actions should be taken by journalists to prevent public or hacker to access to their personal data? Yeah, doxing is actually uh, one of the uh, cyber threat as well. Uh, but uh, it is actually the act of publicly revealing of uh, your personal information, your private information, right? How do you as a journalist protect yourself? I think I've spoken about the three uh, CUU. Uh, one is the use of a password and the uh, use of a protected browser and your VPN. This could actually help you uh, or prevent you or protect you from becoming a doxing um, um, a victim. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kavita. Um, so I guess uh, this is the end of our Q&A session. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kavita Muti, for answering the questions with such interesting views. Um, also, a reminder for participants, please do check your uh, inbox or your chat box because um, some of the participants, we are not able to contact them. Um, okay, so I think now we can have a quick photo session with Dr. Kavita. So everyone, please open your camera and give your best smile. Okay, everyone, make sure you open your camera. Okay. All right, one, two, three. Another one. One, two, three. All right, freestyle. Come on. One, two, three. 
another one one two three we are going to have a ma uh, as many as we can so <laughs> post as many as you can one two three all right one more one two three one two three the last one smile say cheese one two three all right what? thank you <laughs> okay that's very nice uh, for the organizer and also i think uh, uh, uitm have done a great job of gathering all this journalists uh, to be the leader to be and i wish you all the best in your writing in your journey to become a journalist thank you so thank much you. dr kavita you're welcome bye see you all soon <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kapita. All right, may the sharing we have today benefit us in all possible ways, especially in protecting ourselves from cyber threats and dangers, gaining awareness on preventing them, especially for journalists and future journalists. A reminder for participants, for the Q&A session, please write your question along with your name and which university you are from, and the questions can be in English or in Malay. In a few minutes, we will start with our second session entitled News Agency and Journalist Vulnerability to Cyber Threats, where this topic will be presented by Ms. Fabiana Fridaus, an independent investigative journalist based in Bali, Indonesia. Graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Elanga University, Indonesia in 2006, Ms. Fabrena has 10 years of experience in journalism and used to be a freelance journalist of various news agencies such as Time, Al Jazeera, The Guardian and Thomson Reuters Foundation. She is currently a part-time contributor for The Guardian. Throughout her career, she reported on many major issues including LGBT rights, politics, terrorism, election, Rohingya refugees and corruption. Journalists are exposed to various challenges while delivering the news. It could be a life-changing event to the journalist itself. So this issue needs to be discussed further. Now we will welcome Ms. Fabrana Fridaus to the stage. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you for the house. Hi everyone, I'm Fabriana Firdaus, uh, an independent investigative journalist. I think the host has uh, like explained about me a little bit. I think a lot actually. And hi, I'm in Bali, eastern part of Indonesia. Hi Ms. Fabriana, how are you today? Um, I'm fine. I just finished uh, teaching uh, Indonesian journalists the first session with the uh, uh, Alliance of Independent Indonesian Journalists. I see. Um, I hope you are well today and we are looking forward to your sharing session today. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Hoss. I think I want to share uh, my slide uh, with... Um, screen right okay mm -hmm. can everyone see my slide? can everyone see my slide yes you can see your slides okay thank you so much i'm so oh, yeah. happy to share with the young students in Indonesia and Malaysia, if I'm not mistaken, and then very excited because um, I think like um, I hope it will be very useful for all of you who wants to be journalists. Um, I think most of the uh, students um, in journalism department in Indonesia, they prefer to be a PR or like a communication manager rather than a journalist, and it makes me sad because. 
I graduate from the sociology department, I really want to be a journalist instead of being a, t a lecturer. So I hope that um, many of the young many of the young students in journalism department in the future wants to continue our work to be a journalist. So yeah, um, I just actually I just finished my slide this morning because I have so many deadlines. I'm working for different uh, publications um, in the UK, in the USA. So I'm I'm trying to like uh, um, finish the. I'm trying to share my experience with you all. I hope. Um, I hope that it will be useful. So this is my experience. This is based of my experience in 2016 until 2019. So um, yeah, this is just um, a little bit introductions that actually Indonesian and international readers know me for covering a sensitive issue and consider taboo Indonesia. First is LGBT issue. Why? Because Indonesia is a Muslim majority country and the largest ones. And the LGBT issue is very sensitive. We believe here, most of us believe that LGBT is a disease, which is if you're a journalist, uh, you uphold like the universal value. That's the first thing that you have to remember that you adhere or uphold the universal value. Um, so for, for me as a journalist, LGBT uh, is not a disease. Um, and then the 1965 massacre issue, um, it is the most sensitive issue uh, because uh, during the 1965, half of millions Indonesian accused of uh, being communists were kidnapped and killed. So uh, until today, um the case never broke to the court the case never broke to the justice and indonesia always denied this this is like um the most sensitive human right issue in indonesia and then of course the third is west papua issue um this is like uh the next level of a sensitive issue because many of Indonesians uh, deny that our country is, is actually occupied West Papua. So that will be a, a very long story. Um, you can read my article in the Jacobin magazine or um, in Al Jazeera about uh, West Papua or in Guardians. But I think the best one is in the Jacobin uh, magazine USA. You can Google Fabriana Firdaus, West Papua, Jacobin magazine, and then you can find out uh, what is the issue between Indonesia and West Papua. Okay, so I experienced the first threat, uh, I think like five years I uh, after, um, six years up after I'm um, I was active, become a journalist. Um, so this is the dispatch from the Human Rights Watch. Indonesia journalists under threat from militants. You can Google and read the article. So the first threat I received is from the Muslim militant. It's from the Islamic Defender Front. Um, they respond to my article about the verdict of the People Tribunal of 1965. So there, there was a tribunal in The Hague, Netherlands, organized by the academicians, human rights activists, and the victims of the 1965. So the tribunal mentioned that Indonesia was guilty and responsible for the killing of the half millions of Indonesians in 1965. Um, they accuse by publishing this article, they accuse me as pro communist So, um, yeah, anyone who trying to expose this human rights case in 1965, 
whether you are a journalist or a human rights activist, uh, the, the, the ultranationalist and Muslim militant will accuse you of being a communist because um, this is a common thing in Indonesia, common knowledge in Indonesia that the, this that this uh, Muslim militant is very close with the retired military generals who was involved in the killing. That's why they target me. And then um, I was covering there even because it was my, uh, I, I was on assignment to cover that, my editor sent me. And when I cover their events, they tweet, they have like hundreds thousand followers. They tweet that I am a pro-communist and then a retired general came to me and talked to me and said to me and warned me that he didn't like what I was doing, like writing this story and literally just came to me and said that I don't like it. And then, and then uh, a, a dozen of FBI member and actually uh, uh, the ultranational, the member of ultranationalist group, um, they expel me from the building. But before they argue with me, so they bring a phone with my picture and said, oh, so you are Fabriana Firdaus. So first digital attack and then they came after me. So you're a Fabriana Firdaus. So this is Fabriana Firdaus. So everyone came to me and then trying to debate me and say that they, they could arrest me. Uh, even talk actually they couldn't and I'm I was trying to explain to them that you you cannot arrest me um, and then if you want to complain you have to send the email to this uh, address to my office and then they refuse to do that and then they they expel me from the building and then the second threat this is like the scarier ones i don't know but um indonesia uh, celebrates the anti-communist day every september 30 and i was experienced this this is like the most difficult time for me because my mom like called me she was crying and then told me that a military member presents my photo as a neo-communist to the audience in a religious meeting in Madura Island. Um, and all my family like were scared and they asked me to stop being journalist because this is getting dangerous. And then I, I don't know what's the motive until today. And at the same day, that photo also uh, circulates on social media that I am a neo-communist just because I wrote a story back in 2016 but the effect is still happened until 2017. And then the second threat that I experienced is when I broke the news. So I broke the news about the killing of the six Papuan protesters in the remotely high line of Papua. Uh, so the government um, cut the phone signal and the internet. But I managed to, to broke the news because my source escaped to the forest and found signal and sent me all the information that I need. So if you are a journalist, if a shooting happened, if a protester killed in the very remote area, all you have to do is to find a way to break the news because if you don't break the news, uh, the news will disappear and no one will uh, hold the, uh, the government accountable for that. So you have to do that. So that's what I did. And then what happened after that, the government set a press conference and called my report as hoax. So specifically called my article as a hoax. And the communication ministry, so this is me against my country, put my article on the website officially and call it as hoax. And then I received death threats and a message that the intelligence agent were monitoring me. 
Um, and then a pro-government infotainment accounts with million followers, like one million dogs me and call me my article as well. So I was in a very difficult situation. And what happens uh, to me during the attack? Of course, I was shocked and scared. Um, after the milit Muslim militant FBI expelled me from the building, after the, ex the government um, set a press conference and denied that there, is a, there were a protester being killed by the police. So I was scared and shocked and my family called me. It was very panic. And of course, I was crying because I don't know what to do. And then I was crying because I was sad because um, I was just merely doing my job. But these people against my reporting, which is I just I just did my job. I just give um, the best of me to cover the story. And then um, I evacuate to the safe house uh, for at least a week provided by the islands of Indonesian journalists, independent Indonesian journalists. And then I was not allowed to replay all the music because everyone wanted to ask, uh, how are you, Fabri? Are you OK? Are you safe? So um, I was not allowed to replay all this message. So I could take a rest. And then there is an expert on cyber threat in Indonesia, uh, Dita Chaturani. Uh, she helped me to secure all my social media and lock my phone and erase all the information and access in my laptop. And then also there is a non-profit organization called uh, SafeNet. They contact Twitter and Facebook to protect my account. Um, and then I went to psychiatry to treat my trauma and my family were also secure. And also uh, I'm lucky because of Free Press Unlimited, the international organizations, organization that took, took care of um, all my emails to make sure that I, will, I was secure. Oh yeah, this is the hardest thing that I regularly receive so many email phishing to restart the password of my email. If you receive something like this, don't click it. And yeah, what I learned from my experience Mm. So here, that cyber threat is not a single one. It always followed by a physical threat. So, so once once that they spread your uh, private information, then some of the group will come after you. Um, if they know like where your family is based, they are going to come after your family like what happened to my family in Madura Island, Islands. And then if they know where I live, that's why I have to like immediately move uh, to my, to the safe house or, or, or and then um, to the new place because I think like people were angry because they thought that it was hoax. Like ordinary people angry with me because the government stated that my article was hoax. So they, they there is a possibility they will come after me. So what I have to do is just move from where I'm based. And then even talk you're not active in social media, they will find you out. Like for example, a ministry like put like the ID card of the Indonesian human rights activist, Veronica Kaman, um, she is uh, expertise or ex uh, specialized on the West Papua issue. Imagine like a minister put the ID card of uh, the human rights activists because they criticize the government. Um, and then it's a systematic threat and well planned. Um, it's not like a random uh, threat on social media. Though, so you, I, I noticed that there is like similar or like, co like it's it's even like copies all these texts and narrative about me on social media that I am a communist. Um, it's 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 similar. It's it's like copy, and then I think I think what we call with bots, 
um, or like a cyber army, they just copy all the text. It's the same text. Um, I think like uh, there is like one leader who like give them orders, spread this, and then it's become um, trending topic. And it has timeline. Usually that uh, the people that you were criticized, that you are criticized, they will give like an approval, like the government. And then after that came thousands of pro-government cyber army. Um, and then followed by uh, ordinary people who are, who are angry with your article. That's typically, that's how it's uh, the timelines. And then uh, people think that Islamists is dangerous, but for me, Islamists and ultranationalists, everyone who is um, very fanatic, they are dangerous, both of them. And not every newsroom has safety protocol. Um, this has happened to me when I broke uh, the news of 1965 massacre. At that time, my office didn't have a safety protocol. But when I broke about West Papua story for Al Jazeera, they had a safety protocol so I can secure myself. And um, I just learned that the alliance of journalists is more effective to handle my issue. So organize and unite, join the organization, journalist organizations. So this is like, um, so this is like um, actually like the last plan if the government and if the police name me as a suspect, I'm, I'm going to need an asylum. So I contact the UNHCR <laughs> and it, it you have to prepare for the worst case, right? And then, yeah, the plan is still active until to this day. If the police name me as a suspect, if the government trying to uh, criminalize me, I think I'm going to be as an, I, I, I think I'm going to request an asylum. I don't have a choice. And, and then, I learned how to secure my social media by myself. So first, I delete my FB. Why? Because I don't believe in Facebook. I only use Twitter for sharing my articles. Um, second, I set my social media very strictly. I don't get any notification except from the people that I follow and only a lot of people that I follow to comments and no one can share my post and my story on IG. And third, um, never post exact location or so share live events on social media. Not even your office asks you, I'm not going to do that. And never post the picture of your family in date. And then never share my phone number in public. And always use a different number or fake name or ID for my Gojek or Grab application. Because sometimes I use Gojek or Grab uh, because I really need it. And never reply to any buzzer on social media, especially pro-government buzzer. And strict on only posting about news by satellite phone because in case that uh, you feel not secure use satellite phone or if you like reporting a story from uh, from the remote you need a satellite phone and never use apps sometimes apps they ask for like a request to your uh, informations never use apps or use like different phones and log all your social media with a very difficult password and uh, you have to uh, change the password very often and layer it with other security options. Yeah, and then what was I knew when I was student because no one ever told me about this before and I hope that everyone will pay attention. 
Before you start a job as a journalist, you have to delete all the information about yourself. Your blog or everything, just delete it. Or maybe you want to create one, but I would recommend her to delete it and use Twitter and LinkedIn only. And you always need like two phones, actually. First is for the family. And if you can like register your phones with other people ID, not your ID uh, for the family ones. And again, buy satellite phone if you have a budget and then do not ever break any sensitive news on social media. So if you work for like, for example, Malaysia Kini, and then you know that it's a very sensitive, so you have to let you have to let your office or Malaysia Kini official Twitter accounts to break the news. Don't 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 let them don't let them to ask you to do that. It's very dangerous. Only use Proton Mail and Signal. Why? Gmail is not safe. <laughs> WhatsApp is not safe. Many case in Indonesia, uh, the activists and journalists signal eh, sorry whatsapp got hijacked so you have to use signal only check whether your office provides safety protocol and will cover all the costs i didn't do that that's my fault that was my fault so if you want to apply for a job if they ask you about you do you have any questions you ask this question if something happened to me if I've covered like very sensitive issue in my country, like for example, Rohingya of refugee in Malaysia, it's very sensitive issue. Uh, do you have like a safety protocol? Are you going to cover all the costs uh, for my safety? You have to ask. And then check whether your office provide a lawyer for you. In Indonesia, we have LBH Press or Press Legal Aid uh, that will help a journalist to process uh, legal suits. In my case, for example, FBI. So you have to make sure it's written in the contract. You have to fight for that because it's very dangerous. First is safety protocol. Second is um, a lawyer. So it's 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 like really important. It should be written in the contract. Um, of course. Next is join Journalist Alliance and register myself to SafeNet. And then in the end, you have to count on yourself um, because in my case, like in the first case, my office didn't support me. But in the second case, uh, my office is fully support me. So, but in the end, you have to count on yourself. You have to be very active to report yourself like for example i'm very active to report myself to my office that this is dangerous i feel that this is dangerous and then report myself to the alliance of the journalists report myself to the free, free press unlimited so in case of indonesia i'm not alone so according to the Indonesia Alliance of Independent Journalists, there were 64 cases, and then um, there is like a new trend that is worrying that's um, called a doxing or online persecutions. It, it is a new trend in Indonesia right now, especially during the pandemic. So, and um, yeah. It's, it's, it's actually the new trend is started in 2018 and then um, it increased until today. Um, this is a data from the IG. Uh, there is like uh, in 2021 alone, there, there, there are, sorry, in 2000, from May 2020 to April 2021 alone, there have been like 14 terror cases in the form of digital attacks. This is experienced by the journalists. 
um, and then here's like the list of the case. You can see that a doxing is become a trend, and also like um, they hack uh, the WhatsApp or like social media of the journalists. So you have to be careful with your social media. Um, always uh, change your passport very often. Uh, this is some of the case happen in Indonesia and then website hacking. Um, this year alone, um, we experienced in Indonesia like um, I think like for media, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, for media, Tempo, Tirto, Conde, and Madeline.co. So Tempo and Tirto uh, expose about uh, um, job creation law buzzer, um, omnibus law or job creation bill buzzer that um, apparently the government paid some celebrity or influencer to promote this bill that actually very controversial um, this bill um, discriminates um, the Indonesian worker and then also another side that very focal on voicing the rights of women and minority group Conde and Magdalene they also got attacked by DDOS so um, it increased during, especially during the pandemic. And the case is not going anywhere. No one of these case processed by the police. And a dog scene uh, is not regulated yet in, our, in, 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 in Indonesia. There is no regulation, especially mentioned about dog scene. And yeah, I think like um, if you are in Southeast Asia, um, there are some of the um, some of the organization that can help you to uh, dealing with a cyber threat or help you to secure secure your account. First is FreePass Unlimited. Um, you can just contact them directly via email and they will like uh, immediately um, respond to your email, especially if it's emergency. Um, so I always contact them and they are very helpful anytime they help me to secure my email and then not only my email, but also like my social media and even my, like my like top from the distance they will give me like some tips how to secure my laptop and password and everything and then so safe nets i think that if you're in malaysia you still can register yourself to safe nets so safe net will help you to secure your social media so safe net will send uh your data to twitter and fb and instagram and inform them that this a journalist or activist need to be protective so if anyone hijack their social media it needs to be restored by the twitter by instagram and fb and it's very active effective in my case so i think like i will recommend you to contact the safe nets uh, when in the first year first year you become a journalist so, um, and then Twitter, you also can directly register yourself to Twitter and uh, request them to protect your account if you're a journalist just by uh, attaching uh, your press card or um, filling the formulaire that they send to you. But I, I think like Twitter Indonesia is very responsive. They also invite me for some events. So I always like aside from like report myself to the safe net but i also like contact twitter directly um and of course um if you need uh, some networking you can work together with the alliance of independent journalists in indonesia 
uh, they also have some training. They will give you like free training how to secure uh, your laptop and your social media. Yeah, I think that um, I think that that's I can share with you all. Um, I think I, we can like discuss and you can ask some questions to me. And I, I think like that's from my experience as a journalist in Indonesia. When I was a student like you, I have never thought that I will experience this. And it's a very tough and it's very hard. And and then it's affect my mental health. Until today, I'm still healing. Um, it will be like forever healing for me. I don't know how to cope with this uh, trauma, but I'm still healing until today. So it's remember when you experience an attack, it's not going to be disappear in. Um, it's not going to be disappear in one or two days or one week. It's even like I still have like this uh, breakdown moment when, like I don't know, I just spend my holiday by myself and then I remember what I experienced and I'm and suddenly i feel very sad and i'm and, and i'm crying without no reason so it's happened but um yeah i think like i think like prepare yourself that the prepare yourself like your mental health that you need to like to take a rest do exercise um exercise can help you to cope with uh trauma i think and then go take care of your mental health, that's very important, and learn how to secure your accounts, and then um, join the organization, journalist organization is very, very important because you feel like you're not alone. You're not alone. Um, and then register yourself to any organization that helps you. And the most important thing that you have to remember that when you enter in the industry, the industry is not ideal at all. Some of the newsroom, they don't care if you experience this. They don't really care. Even like one of my editors said that I, if when like the Alliance journalists uh, encouraged me to file a legal suit against the Islamic Defender Front, like it's like the strongest Islamist group in Indonesia, which is now banned by the Indonesian government. Um, it's it's they have they have been in power and then and then i want to file a legal suit but my office didn't support me so i have to drop it because i don't want to file a lawsuit and then i'm alone there so i don't get a support but then the second the second case um the military the staff from the Indonesian military uh, approach my editor and then they say they're not going to uh, take down the article. So they defend me, the Al Jazeera defend me and it's very helpful and I'm so happy that they take care of me. So remember that especially if you work as a freelance like me, remember if you're a journalist if you want to enter the journalism industry, when you sign a contract, that's like the, aside from the um, uh, insurance and then the salary, the proper salary, you have to ask for the protections. Do your office have a safety protocol for a journalist who covers sensitive issues? And then it should be written in the contract. And then are you going to provide me a lawyer? If I'm in a trouble and provide me a safe house, do you have this mechanism? If you don't have it, I cannot assign the contract. And I cannot sign the contract. So it's very important for the student if you want to enter the, the um, journalism industry, the real in the field that they don't even care. They just want to break the news and they just want to get the clickbait story and they just want to they just want your article to be viral. My article, I always heard. I always publish a fire article. The last article that I published that fire is about 
influencer in Bali for The Guardian. It became a viral, the most viral article in The Guardian, like in The Guardian, in, in that thing. So I always publish a viral article, but also like it's, it's also like post a threat for me. So you have to make sure that the newsroom support you and then the newsroom provide a safety protocol for you because there is a news without the protection for the journalists. There is nothing worth for anything of this news but to protect the journalists. So I think that's everyone can ask question now. All right, thank you, Ms. Fabriana. Um, I believe that um, the sharing that you have shared to us today is a very heavy topic for you personally. And it's actually a very insightful sharing for all of the students out there, including journalism students. So again, thank you so much, Ms. Fabriana, for joining us today and addressing this compelling topic. But um, do not leave yet because right now we will move on to the Q&A session with the participants. Also for all participants, please take note that question submissions are now closed. There is already a question in the chat session. All right, uh, Ms. Fabrena, we will move on to the Q&A session. Um, I have here for the first question, um, it's from Jacinta from UITM Shah Alam. And the question is, if I'm not mistaken, there is a protest against the one perwakilan right yet in your home country last year. And many student bodies took part in the protest uh, where it is seen all over TikTok. So um, are the students safety guaranteed because uh, they joined the protest? Um, yeah, um, do you ask about the student protection? Um, are they guaranteed of their safety when they are out for protest? Actually, there is no guarantee from their campus, <laughs> from their university, but there are so many civil groups that, pro that provide the safety protocol for them. So um, the most well-known one is um, Indonesia Legal Aids. They always uh, provide this uh, safety protocol and so many so many civil what i love about indonesia we have a very strong civil group um in the middle of the um you know you know we are under like this jokowi regime which is like i think it's very authoritarian if anyone disagree with me i cannot cook but um he is very authoritarian in in my opinions and but we have a very strong civil group um across indonesia and we help each other and that's that's how the civil group not only protect the students but also the journalists actually um so many like the civil group helped me a lot um to go through all the strife um since 2016. yeah uh, the civil group but from the campus if you um so recently like indonesian students union uh, summon by the rector of the university of indonesia because they criticized uh, president jokowi as the king of lip service because what he said he never implements what he said he always promised like he always give like a fake promise to indonesians so um the rector now like under the public scrutiny by the civil group and indonesians in general across indonesia and it's it's like a national outcry uh, because the rector summons the Indonesian students unions. So so we like bought journalist civil group and then um, indigenous community group. We push like we say that we are with Indonesian student unions that we should give like freedom of expression to everyone. 
students to express their opinions. All right, thank you for the answer. Um, the next question I have from... Uh, a question from Renanda, a semester six communication student from Indonesia. Um, I would like to ask you, since when and why did you choose to cover those sensitive issues? How did you still cover them despite all threats that have attacked you along your journey as an independent journalist? Yeah, um, I choose that sensitive issue because um, I was situated in that position that I have to publish. So in 2016, why I covered the LGBT issue? Because there was an LGBT crackdown. So I have to educate my readers that this hate speech against the LGBT need to be stopped as a journalist. So I just wrote a story and interview a psychologist and that said that LGBT is not a disease and then social loop, and then so many experts uh, who can explain about LGBT. And then why I also cover about other sensitive issues, 1965 massacre, for example, because there is also a moment um, to break the news. Um, so we had uh, what we call as a 1965 people tribunal in, in the Hague. That's, I'm not going to like step up into that game if there is no moment. So it was, there is a moment and I give my best to cover that story. And um, I know that I pick an angle that different from my college or fellow journalists that for example, I usually put the vulnerable, com vulnerable community on the top of the angle. Like, for example, I put like the angle of the victim or survivor who was raped during 1965. So I, I really like put a lot of human interest in my story. Whether like my other fellow journalists just report that Indonesia is guilty, I put like a story about this woman who was raped and then um, he seek for justice. And uh, specifically, specifically about West Papua issue, why I uh, choose that to 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 like focus on that story because no one of the Indonesian journalists at that time want to like start this conversation about the occupation that we actually occupy the West Papua. That there is like an alternative source about the history between Indonesia and West Papua that they never voluntarily joined Indonesia. So I started conversations and then interview and I went to West Papua and covered different story about how suffer the family victims of the killing of the children in West Papua. So many of the children in West Papua are being killed by the Indonesian military uh they also like uh, uh, yeah so many case case of the killing by the indonesian military and i exposed one of them and i published that story uh, and what I, what keep me going because every time you meet the these people your source you knew that if if you're not the one who write the story and who else like you have to like expose this case like you cannot just think about yourself okay i can like accept i can like be in my safe space and then cover like nice story but that's not like the purpose of being journalist because as a journalist you have to give voice to the voiceless and i have the responsibility to do that as a journalist so many of these victims cannot find a place and platform to speak. Like for example, the issue with indigenous community um, who, whose forests um, take over, took over by the palm oil industry in Indonesia, like for example, who is going to give them the space to speak their own version? It's us, the journalists. 
So that's, that's why we have to keep going publish these stories. And of course, that's why I encourage other journalists out to step up from their own safe space and then take this responsibility. It is very sensitive, but you have to do that. Like for example, in Malaysia, you have to be able like to get up from your comfort zone and report like, for example, Rohingya refugee. That's like the same scale of um, sensitive topic in my country we we treat Rohingya very nice because I don't know it's different in Indonesia I don't, in Malaysia it's different in my country the issue is LGBT West Papua and then 1965 all right thank you Miss Rabiana for the answers and the next question is from the question is from youtube as we also have a live stream on youtube so a uh, question from danish of one uh, is it true that by using vpn we can secure our devices online traffic and network meaning that um, the use of vpn itself uh, is it good enough to guard ourselves from being hijacked or hacked or we should like add on more security instead of solely re relying on VPN? I think it's VPN is good and it's just one point. You still have to layer and uh, your security and then um, you, you still have to change your passwords very often and then use a uh, website that's secure, like for example, use Proton Mail. Uh, and use signal not whatsapp so um i think vpn is very useful but i think you still need to layer your the security especially change your password very often and don't save your password in the laptop or website like google chrome or everything i used to put my uh, password in the not notes in my laptop so it's not online so I put it in the notepad in my laptop. It's not online. Uh, Ms. Fabrana, I'd like to add on a question from your last answer about the passwords. Um, so there is this, um, I think it's a software that uh, it's a local uh, file software where it's on your laptop, but it's not on the website where it can generate um, random passwords for your social media like or game accounts and such and then um, you can access them on your laptop as in it's a file um, do you think that's safe it's not actually on the website or anything um safenet actually um recommend me to use that one but since like i'm very traumatic with my experience so I just use random password that only me knew that password and put it in the notes, like offline notepad, like no one can access. I think like the more you minimize uh, sharing your information, like it's it's the more secure. So I use like, like very, very offline. I, I use every single offline application. Notepad is very secure like notes in your, it's it's just use the offline to save the passwords. And I have to be creative with passwords and change very often. So yeah, I don't use that application or software, but SafeNet recommend me to use that one, but I don't use that. I see. So um, meaning that offline uh, offline tools are actually more safe than online tools or it's actually the same level? Uh, I think ev everything has, um, offline also has the weakness, like if suddenly like your la laptop is broken, <laughs> so you don't know the password. Um, I think, yeah, I think like I, I will like, um, I still have a backup, like for example, put put it on, on my network, like for example. Um, so I think I've, I've, like, I, I personally prefer offline. I feel like more safe. I don't know like the one is better than the other or 
the one is more weak than the other, but I trust offline applications. It, I feel safe using that offline application. And also like I share my password to my best friend and say that if something happened to me, my laptop password is for uh, numbers and you know the numbers. So that, that's only my best friend. And I talk with my best friends when I met her. So during like a very um, difficult situation, if something happened to me, like um, I disappear or like someone like shoot me, whatever, he she knows like the password to open my laptop and to like erase all the data. And she, she has the access to my information, all the passwords. So I, I share with one person. If something happened to me, you contact my family and this is the password of the laptop. I see. Thank you for the answers for previous questions. So um, the next question I have here is from Fatin Fatiha from Unimap. Um, the con in the context of big data, it is stored in an in an ineffective cloud-based storage where hackers potentially can access to your file. Is it efficient to use two-factor authentication where, us where users are required to confirm their identity twice instead of using security systems that provide one layer protection? Yeah, uh, it is very recommended to use um, two-factor authentication applications but i never use any cloud based storage why don't you just buy like um like big flex disk with big capacity again like you don't trust any of this application because there's always a bug on it like the hacker always can breach into that data if you put it in digitally like there is like uh, i talk with so many like people like who's very expert on cyber security there is always a bug on it and then the hacker can enter so why don't you just buy this um flash disk that with very large capacity it's very useful Actually, uh, Miss Fabrina, I understand that uh, having a physical device would be more secure than storing information on on the cloud. But then, um, I I feel like it might be a slight inconvenience. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say if something were to happen to the device yeah. itself. Yeah, you still need like a backup. Um, yeah maybe is there is there a, a more secure way to store our data online i never store my data online <laughs> especially if it's like a classified document like for example military document i'm not going to put it online i'm just going to save it in my open flash disk because it i mean there is always a chance like someone will get the data if you put it online unfortunately like i don't know how to like but if you have to do that so use this uh two-factor authentication it will it's very helpful and don't use like there is like two uh factor authentication using a short message or from your phone don't use that because the government have a power to read that message. So the government or intelligent can open the data if you use that. Um, so there is like a two um, to, to like authentications via SMS or short message in your phone, don't use this because you are using provider that the governments can request anytime uh, to read your message and then they will find out the intelligent will find out the codes All right, so um, the next question I have here is uh, 
Okay. Um, a question from Marcella from UITM Sha'alam. And the question is, how can future journalists prepare themselves on handling cyber threats? I think you actually explained this a little bit earlier. Um, maybe you can um, explain it again to the audience. How can journalists prepare themselves on handling cyber threats? Um, you know when it will happen because like, for example, you break the news. So when you knew that you are going to break the news, you can just go offline like, um, how do you call it? Deactivate your account. And then, of course, yeah, like I told you before, like before you become a journalist, just clean all, all your data, like delete, like essential information, even like delete your FB account. You just, you don't need it. Like you don't need this, all of this, except LinkedIn and Twitter. Twitter, just share your article. You need it to, if you don't want to be on Twitter also, it's cool. Like you don't have to be on Twitter. You just need LinkedIn because you need to post your, um, your article or your news. So I think like um, how to prepare yourself. Yeah, don't engage a lot in the internet. Like you have to like distance yourself. Um, but you still need the internet to uh, seek for any information. Like for us to follow the update, what happens, uh, what the people talk about the politics uh, and everything, a uh, breaking news, whatever you still need it. Um, and then you have like, like if you're in social media, uh, stay low. <laughs> Just stay low. Just share about your professions of journalists. Share about news. Don't engage in any anything that will pose a threat for you. Okay, thank you, Miss Fairbrenner, for your answers. Um, I'll, I'm still uh, reading through. Is there any more questions I haven't asked? Uh, let's see. Okay, um, the question from Webex from the audience is that um, what motivates and drives you to become an investigative journalist in your country where greater threats uh, you are re you receive greater threats from society and the government. So, um, what keeps you going? What makes you not want to quit? Yeah. Um. First, because I love the cho this job, of course. Like I'm very passionate of this job. And secondly, because I've been exposed a lot a lot with social injustice, like in my family, especially. Um. I experienced a lot of this. Um, I saw my neighbor, I saw my big family, I saw my friend, I saw something like injustice, social injustice, even like in my university, my school. So it's based on first, like I have this strong foundation that um, I want to contribute something because I love my country. Um, even though my country doesn't love me. <laughs> um, but um, I feel that that I have a very strong foundation to contribute something that it led me to be a journalist. And by being journalist, I know that um, it's very like powerful job to make a change and I want to make a change. And then what keep me going um, every time like I cover a story, like I don't feel satisfied not only breaking the news but i want like to expose like for example there was like a killing of the children in west papua in paniai west papua by a military member and it's the government deny that the military deny that and then i went to west papua i climbed in west papua and i i investigate all the, uh, the the case and also like only found a military document investigation on that and and then everyone like start to think that this happened so that's the feeling when i feel that i contribute something that one person should be accountable like one one 
one human it's important the life of one human is important for me so i don't want these people like being forgotten because like for example they live in in a very remote place like west papua i want like these children i want the government um like admit that the military kill the children that this 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 life of one human is very important whether it's in java islands or in papua islands in new new guinea islands so that's like what drives me into investigative reporting that what buries what the information that buries i need to expose it i i need to to tell i need to investigate so people like understand that it's very hard actually to investigate that i i also like um experience very difficult situation after that but if we can expose one case it will give a power um it will give a hope to another family victim so and then it will give a message to the perpetrator or indonesian government anyone who have power or military member that we are not going to be silenced and as a journalist that's your job yes so i agree that this is well it might be one case but the military yeah. then think okay she could find that document and then she could expose one person so we have to be careful in the next operation like for example and it's children and everyone like get involved with the article because it's children so then everyone learning about what happened in west papua and then everyone learning about the political history of west papua oh it's occupied by indonesia that start from like one evening if you can just break one and then if you keep doing that then that's that's the function of the journalist Yes, I totally agree with you, Miss Fabriana. Um, so the the next question is from Uze. Um, the question is that uh, is there uh, early on you said of uh, about the safe organization um, that covered that you are covered from the last slide. So um, does it cover other media practitioners or is it specifically for journalists only? Uh, safe net. What, which organization? Um, I think in general, I guess. Oh yeah. And you said about the safety protocol. Yeah, yeah. Uh, free press unlimited, of course, only for journalists. Uh, I think SafeNet. Uh, they, they are dealing with so many cases involving, um, journalists, activists, like, even like ordinary people if they wants to ask for, for like uh, help like to assist their case um i think they are very open and it's so based in southeast asia so not only people in indonesia but also malaysia myanmar laos vietnam they can contact and consult to safe men. i think they are very helpful until to this day but mostly like they are uh assisting a case in indonesia but i always like because uh the the chief of the safe net is i'm very close with him since my case in 2016 so i always get the update from him and then yeah so many cases like even like the case of the instagram uh user that criticize uh beauty product and then the beauty product shoe her for that treaty and safe net assist that case as well so it's they are like actually promoting the freedoms of ex expression internet freedom expression so this issue all right uh, so yes freedom of expression is definitely important and for the next question, I have a question from Zulaika, a semester five journalism student from UITM Sha'alam. And the question is, um, since you have shared with us 
uh, your challenges and all the cyber threats that you have faced. So does these threats actually affect your news writing where um, you become more um, careful in writing sensitive issues? Oh yeah, uh, the more that people trap me, the more that I'm very excited and passionate to write another investigative story. So um, it's not going to stop me. It's maybe like I'm going to take a break after that, after the threat, but uh, it's, it's okay. I learned a lot about the threat and then, okay, I'm going to use this strategy, but I feel like when I receive a threat, it means that it works. The article that I publish, the people and the people who have the power in the military and anyone who I mention in my article actually read the article. That's why they react by like sending cyber army and then sending this group of people of FBI or international group to attack me and then uh, sending someone uh to like uh like like terror my family so it works actually so i feel like oh this is work and i'm going to repeat it and um, it's it's not going to stop me it gives me like another idea to write and keep investigate because finally they pay attention to that and that's what i wanted as a journalist i want to see the reaction also from the people that I wrote about. Um, like, it's like calling them out and then they feel called out. And then that's like the purpose of publishing the story because I exposed them. So I inspired until today, I'm still investigating another case in West Papua. And then the latest that now, like I'm still in progress in investigate like the second series of the malnutrition case in West Papua, where many of the children died from malnutrition because the palm oil plantation took over the sagu forest. So that was, that will be like, we are like 50% right now. So um, we have like this first investigation and we continue um, the sequel and I still investigate um, like so many cases, like I'm, I'm still excited um, to do that and you give me idea it works actually. And also I feel like, uh, I feel like I'm contribute something. That's the most important. I feel alive as a journalist, even talk like under the trap, but I feel alive actually. And uh, I learned how to read, uh, how to write better after that. Meaning that um, even though you have received lots of threats, you won't actually filter out your um, contents of writing? No, right? no, I, I don't have a plan to filter it. I don't have a plan. Um, now, like I learned another skill making a documentary film project, which is like the effect, like they have like bigger impact than just my writing in English. I, I wrote that story in English. It's already make an impact. How about if I make a documentary film? It's already also, I published my first documentary also. So I think like, um, I think like, um, I don't have any plan to filter my writing in the next future at all. I don't have a plan. And I think like I uphold this code ethic of journalism, a journalistic and it keeps me going, yeah. There's, it's not me. If I'm going to filter this, my writing, I better like to stop being journalist because there is no way I want to filter that. And my editor always know because my editor know that I'm not going to filter it. That's why he always like assign me like if it's important because he's not going to filter it. He's going to be genuine and then follow the rule. All right. Thank you, Ms. Fabrana. I guess um, this marks the end of our Q&A session. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Fabrana Fridos, for answering the questions with such interesting views. So um, before we move on to our photo session, uh, maybe Ms. Fabrana, would you like to um, give 
like last uh, few words of advice to students, especially journalism students? Yeah, for for all the students here who study journalism that even talk that the media industry is not ideal for you, but the spirit of journalism, you have to keep bringing. Um, if people say that, oh, journalism is for like idealist person, I'm 38 years old right now and I'm still idealist. They say that the, 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 you're getting older and you're not going to be idealist and then you don't need this job. No, I'm still idealist. I'm like almost 40 years old and I'm still idealist. I'm still doing this job. I think like the most important that you don't have to be afraid. Um, you don't have to be afraid, but you you have to know when you have to take a break. It's important to take a break. I know that you're very passionate because you are very young. You want to expose something in your country, but remember that you also have family, so you need to have a break. It's it's been like um, my my mother is here with me, so it's it's been like. Um, very difficult time to explain to your family it will be very difficult but by the time they will understand so i think that um if you want to be a journalist just be like a full journalist keep the best and then yeah you just have to be convinced that you will be protected especially if you're like joining an organization so you don't have to worry but you have to know when you are going to stop for a break, not forever. You don't have, just, just don't quit, just keep going. All right, thank you, Ms. Fabrana. I think it was a really, really great session today. And um, I think now we can have a quick photo session with Ms. Fabrana and everyone, please open your camera and give your best smile. Okay, everyone, please make sure you open your camera. All right, are you guys ready? Okay, I'll be waiting for a few seconds. All right, then. One, two, three. Give me a smile, please. One, two, three. Another one. One, two, three. Okay, freestyle. One, two, three. We'll be going have a lot of photos photo today. One, two, three. All right, smile. One, two, three. Okay, last one. One, two, three. Okay, second last. One, two, three. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So um, now we're done with the photo okay, session. Uh, may the sharing we have just now benefit us in all possible ways. Also, I would like to apologize to participants that we have not asked their questions because we're actually um, running out of time. So now it's time for our lunch break. Participants must come back for the next session at 2.20 and participants are advised to come back 10 minutes earlier. You may have your lunch now but without leaving the WebEx. Just stay connected with us. And with that, we finally come to an end for this morning session and it's also time for me to sign off. May our path cross again in the future. And thank you. See you guys in the next session. And the next session, it will be moderated by Shaza Nadia Samsudin. Have a great lunch, everyone. Bye, Ms. Thank you. Bye, Ms. Thank you. Madam, sekarang masih lunch break.
Jenayah cyber menyebabkan Malaysia kerugian berbilion ringgit. Menurut laporan ancaman keselamatan Sofos 2014, sebuah agensi bebas menyelidik tahap bahaya serangan cyber Malaysia berada pada tangga keenam mudah diserang penyenayah cyber. Mid 2020, a mobile phone belonging to Al Jazeera Arabic was hacked. The team from Al Jazeera unpicked an extraordinary story of some of the most advanced spyware in the world and how it's used, not least on Al Jazeera's journalists. Menurut laporan risiko global yang dikeluarkan oleh Forum Ekonomi Dunia, ancaman keselamatan cyber merupakan salah satu daripada lima risiko global terbesar di dunia. Ini menunjukkan bahawa masih terdapat kelemahan dalam sistem yang sedia ada seiring dengan tren baru seperti Internet of Things dan Big Data.
Hello, assalamualaikum and good afternoon to everyone. Hope you guys are feeling great today and have a good lunch just now. All right. So our guests of honor, Deputy Deans, Professor, Head of Centers, Course Coordinators, Lecturers, Members of the Faculty, Ladies and Gentlemen, Students from the Universitas Pendidika Indonesia, UPI, President University, UCSI University, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, UKM, as well as University Technology Mara, UITM, and other universities as well. Welcome to the 43rd Journalism E-Colloquium for June 2021. Thank you for lending a few hours for this e-colloquium and welcome back to the journalism e-colloquium entitled Digital Safety for Journalists Combating the Rising Threats, brought to you by the Semester 5 students majoring in journalism from the Faculty of Communication and Media Studies, UITM Shah Alam. Before we begin, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Shazana Dia Samsudin, currently in my fourth semester in journalism, and I will be serving as your moderator for today. Thank you for the opportunity given, and I am very much looking forward to the next sharing session where Mr. Ramani Parkunen will be discussing the topic, Cyber Security Toolkit for Journalists. So to ensure a smooth running event, you are required to mute yourself while each panelist session as we do not want to encounter any disruptions. You can also turn on your camera to show full participation. Thank you very much for joining us today and we appreciate your patience as we wait for others to join back into the room. All right, in five minutes, we will start with our third session entitled Cybersecurity Toolkit for Journalists, where this topic will be presented by Mr. Ramani Parkunen, a senior editor at Asia News Today Network. With a degree in computer science from the Montfort University, United Kingdom, as well as a certificate in hacking forensic investigator from EC Council Malaysia, Mr. Romani started his career as a tutor in London teaching management and information technology modules. Upon his return to Malaysia, he joined Cybersecurity Malaysia serving in the training and outreach division. Since his school days, writing has been his passion. When joining Free Malaysia Today, uh, known as FMT. He covered news ranging from current affairs, politics, sports, business, cybersecurity, special interviews, as well as news coverage in the parliament. His tenure in FMT has allowed him to learn the strong basics of news reporting, special interviews, writing columns, and special reports from various news veterans heading the editorial team. Afterwards, he managed to grab an opportunity to increase his experience by working as media officer for the Federal Territory's Deputy Minister, overseeing media protocol and news coverage. He also gained other experiences in the media industry, holding positions as news editor for Malaysia Outlook, as well as news editor and special correspondent for Asia News Today. Recently, he even started the ESPC News Portal under Serba Dynamic and worked as a media consultant to kickstart the project. At the moment, he manages Golden Turf Consultancy and a simple platform, One Malaysia, which focuses on sports and IT topics. His Golden Turf Consultancy firm offers services, media training, media consultancy and IT advisory. In this digital era, journalists should take a few steps ahead in order to protect themselves and their data. One of the ways is that journalists should always prepare themselves with various types of cybersecurity toolkits, which is what this event is uh, talking about today. With the cybersecurity to toolkit, um, we need to take a further look into this topic by welcoming Mr. Romani Parkonen to be to the stage. Let's give him a big round of applause. Hi, Mr. Romani, how are you today? I hope you're well. Good afternoon, Shaza Nadia. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, yes, we can hear you. How are you can today? You? Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on board. Delighted to have you here. We're all looking forward to your sharing session today. So, uh, Mr. Romani, with, without further ado, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Shazana. Yeah. Um, a very good afternoon to all the uh, students from Malaysia and Indonesia, and also not forgetting the UITM officials who 
has arranged this 43rd journalism colloquium. Okay, this is a wonderful uh, uh, platform. And also, they, they came out with a beautiful uh, topic where they have selected is um, digital safety for journalists combating rising threats. Now, um, cyber safety has becoming a, a very, very huge topics actually uh, the last couple of years, especially when we entered the um, COVID-19 pandemic and also the movement uh, control order. So a lot of things are uh, happening and uh, I'm very glad that uh, I've been given this platform to share some experiences. Uh, what are the things uh, we are doing in Asian News Today, especially in um, uh, sharing, uh, disseminating, educating the public. Uh, cyber security, uh, those days, if you look at uh, five years, 10 years down the road, uh, it used to be very much for this uh, technical um, law enforcement uh, circles. But now it has uh, cut across the board. And I think it is the right time that we need to educate all the people out there. It, it doesn't matter whether you stay in, in, in urban areas, in, in rural or kampong areas, everybody should know what is cybersecurity all about. So that is the duty of a journalist and also the media to educate the cybersecurity uh, subject to all these people. All right, so I would like to go into my uh, next slide. Can you flip through the next slide, please? Okay. All right. Um, the introduction. Uh, I'll be covering uh, what do you need to know about cybersecurity. I think uh, today morning you have you had uh, two wonderful speakers, Dr. Kavita and also of the uh, independent um, journalists, if I'm not mistaken, from Indonesia. Uh, they were sharing the expertise, their knowledge on uh, cybersecurity, how journalists and also the organization can uh, protect uh, oneself and also the organization. Uh, perhaps here I would like to just uh, add up, you know, uh, how one can protect uh, from cyber threats, from cyber crimes, being vigil and also I would like to touch more on how to count on fake news and very important to educate the public. So that will be my um, sharing here today. All right. If you can see this slide, I've said that what you need to know. I think communication using technology is everywhere. Yes, it is everywhere. Everyone is communicated via um, um, application, mobile applications, uh, social media platforms. Uh, it has become a norm. You know, you, 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 you can't run away. If, if you can go to the uh, next slide, maybe I can uh, go through some of the social media application which I've listed there. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. OK, um, if you look social media, everyone is hooked up on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, you know, and communication apps, WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram. Then even we are doing our video conferencing using the Cisco WebEx, Zoom, Google Meeting, and online live streaming. This is something not new. Everybody has become very used to this new norm, okay? Whether I would say it is thanks to this uh, pandemic or whether it's thanks to this new norm, it has given an opportunity for us to communicate virtually more often, all right? So whenever we communicate more often, at the same time, 
the aspects of cyber security comes in. The aspects of cyber threats, cyber crimes do also come in. So sometimes this is where we do neglect. Sometimes this is where we uh, tend to be forgetful. Okay. So this is where we need to keep on highlight. Okay. All these issues to the public. This is the main thing which we which we need to do here. Okay, can we can I have the next slide, please? Okay, remote access is the new norm. As I said, virtual communication and remote access as the new norm. Everyone is virtually connected. So, how do we protect ourselves? So, how do we keep ourselves? Safe via the cyberspace. Okay, let's see if you have any, any cyber threats, cyber bullies. Okay, how do you encounter all this? So these are the tips which I will try to go more in depth, and also I would love to listen from you guys. You know, perhaps you can ask me questions uh, from the experiences which I have gone through. I would love to share. Okay. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, how cybersecurity will protect you? Okay, one of the key aspects here is having cybersecurity, it will be very essential and it will make your communication be secured. Okay, there are various ways. I think uh, in the first uh, uh, talk I was uh, listening through, there are some, uh, some of the uh, attendees were asking about uh, uh, VPN. Very interesting question. So it looks like I most of you all know about the technologies out there. But the very important thing here is you have to be always continuously protect and update yourself and equip yourself with all the cybersecurity tools which are available. Okay, that's very important. That's number one. And number two is to maintain privacy. Now, this is a very uh, um, important thing that you have to bear in mind that a lot of people, uh, a lot of us, uh, I think a lot of these youths, you know, this younger generation, they, 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 they tend to spend a lot of time on this TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, you know, especially like putting up photos, uh, you know, let's say you're going for a, you know, for a lunch or dinner or some social gathering or you're going for something, you know, you, you just snap the photo and put it up. So all these you have to sometimes be careful with whom you share, whether you share it public or whether you share it privately, all this you have to be very careful. This is what, uh, you know, I would like to touch on the to maintain the privacy because the reason why I'm saying here, you are the guys who are going to be the future journalists, okay? So you may come across, you may face certain threats. People may follow you. People may uh, could send you some, some emails or could, uh, could, uh, could send some harassment messages. So all this, you need to know how to do tolerate how to counter. So all this you have to bear in mind. And this is where the maintaining of privacy is very important. So the more you keep it, you know, um, keep it silent or keep it maintain it in a private manner, it is very much, I mean, it's much more better actually, rather than just exposing yourself, you're doing this and you're doing that. So you have to be careful. And then the second thing I would like to touch here is certain journalists um, very engaged on using Twitter, especially whenever we have done our stories. We like to tweet. We like to share our stories. We like to tag, you know, certain maybe politicians or certain business circles or certain individuals so you have to be careful on that or maybe sometimes you will have a group where they will attack you so how are you going to counter on that you have to be balanced on this as well 
Okay, so this is a very huge uh, in-depth topic. Perhaps in the Q&A session, remind me, I would like to answer on this as well. Now, proof of recording. Um, those days, whenever, I mean, when we started, uh, we used to go for outside assignments. Okay, we have to go and meet the politicians. Uh, we have to meet the business person. You have to do all you have to take a book. You have to take a pen and you have to write. Then later on, you had this smartphone where you can record the audio, you can record the video. So all it changed actually. Then now we have all these social media platforms which helps to do live streaming, which is really fantastic actually, and makes you know our life much more easier because whenever you record it is one of the proof but at the same time you have to be very careful as well what are you recording sometimes certain contents could be not suitable for your audience certain contents could be suitable so all these you have to filter all these you have to bear in mind before you do all this recording so remember this point as well now encrypted communication um most of the tools out there, I think like WhatsApp, they have end-to-end -end, uh, encrypted communication, uh, which we are safe. Uh, those days we used to have this BlackBerry Messenger, but it's no longer. I think, uh, if not mistaken, Signal, Telegram, they do have this encrypted communication. So communicating with your sources when you're getting uh, information to write a story, to write a report, okay, you have to ensure uh, nobody snoop through or nobody steal your information and uh, use against you. So all this, you have to be careful. So this is where one of the aspects of cybersecurity comes in. Last but not least, check for not hacking. Now, how do you check for not hacking? Sometimes you receive some weird emails, some unknown emails into your inbox, all right? Uh, sometimes you get messages on your Facebook. Sometimes I do get messages on Facebook uh, asking, you know, would you like to interview these people or that people? So all this could be a bait, uh, could be a phishing. So you have to be very careful. You have to be very vigilant with all of this kind of uh, activities which is happening out there. So this is where the, the first defense of cybersecurity comes in. Now, although there are technologies, um, although there are applications out there, the main important layer that which we need to uh, keep always in the mind is the human defense layer because human is the most vulnerable and the most i mean the easiest uh, the weakest point where you can break actually so this is where we are going to discuss further uh, in the tips uh, which i have uh, laid down here okay let me pull out the slides Okay, tips for, okay, before going to that human layer, I will touch more on the technology and the application. Uh, tips for journalists, best practices. I think every time, everywhere, even in the videos, even the cybersecurity experts always keep on preaching and advocating, you know, all these uh, best practices. It is nothing new, actually, it's everywhere. But sometimes we tend to make mistakes. Okay, I will come in to the last part where we make the mistakes, all right? Okay, uh, let me touch on the first point here. Uh, ensure your applications are up to date. Now, what is your ensure your applications up to date? You have a lot of applications, Facebook application, Telegram, WhatsApp, Google. Oh, so many there, okay? So every, sometimes once a month or twice, uh, maybe two months once, you know, sometimes they will send you a message, ask you to update, all right? So you have to update. Now, why you have to update is you have to update for patches. Sometimes the uh, cyber criminals out there, they will find 
find ways to find a loophole to enter into your system. They will find a loophole to enter into your application. So when you update, okay, your applications, it will protect you. That is number one. Number two is you have to update yourself as well. Now, what is to update yourself as well? You have to read a lot. Okay, what is happening in the news? What are the news going around? Okay, what are the news media carries? All these can give you an additional updates as well. So that is updates for your own self. Okay, that's number one. Number two, always perform antivirus check. Um, on our laptop, we have an antivirus check. I think it has become it it, it has become a practice. Actually, we have been using this antivirus. Even um, mobile phones have antivirus. So, antivirus will help you. Say, for example, uh, you have missed the first defense, then at least the second defense which is the antivirus check or maybe the anti malware or anti spyware could help you nowadays uh, most of the mobile antivirus it's quite affordable actually if i'm not mistaken the other day like myself i'm using dg a local line they give a very good package a monthly package from kaspersky okay i'm not promoting the product but there are so many other products there which you can use you can Google up, which you can use in and, and keep it as a second line of defense. That's number two. Number three, keep your files clean and in order. Now, whenever you do your work, whenever you do your journalism work, always remember, save it, okay, in a place which is secure. Normally, you will save it in a desktop, we will save it in a pen drive. Now, don't lose it. Okay, that is very, very important. Okay, you know why? Because sometimes later in the future, if you want to revisit back for the comments or if you want to take any notes from the old stories, you can take from all these uh, orderly files actually. Okay, then you need to keep a safe backup copies it is good it is a good practice like myself normally i have about two three cup copies i'll have one in the laptop maybe a pen drive or maybe somewhere uh, in a secure place okay so you can do that maybe you can do a three copies or four copies okay why is that so i'll give you an example this actually happened there was um attempt once uh, 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 hacking attempt uh, where they tried to uh, put down the Asian News Today server but luckily our IT division had saved backup copies so the moment when it was I mean the um, website went down we quickly within a couple of minutes maybe one two minutes we quickly could re retrieve back if we, we could retrieve back and then we came back with what uh, the copies we had and then we were up and running so when you had the backup copies it will be very helpful for you so this is what so this is what most of the organizations has to bear in mind okay not only organizations but also individually, you can follow this practice. Now, don't share access to anyone or everyone. Uh, this is very important. Sometimes, you know, uh, there are, you know, you, when you trust your friends, you tend to give uh, the passwords or your most trusted credentials to your friends or your family members or whatever whatever please avoid this because we do not know what will happen in the future it is always what i call as the mantra okay of cyber security experts not to share access to anyone or everyone if you tend to say for example 
mistakenly shared access, maybe the password of your Facebook or maybe Twitter or your TikTok, Instagram, don't worry. You got still, you still have time. You can go and change the password. Right? So you can do the changes quickly and it will really help you out. Okay. Ensure tools downloaded and installed as a good rating and recognized by the industry. Now, whenever you download uh, most of the tools, uh, I think Play Store, they have this rating and they have this commands section. Please read the command section before you download. Okay, sometimes it could be a good uh, application. It could be a good application. Sometimes it could be a bogus one. So not to be trapped, there are so many out there, could be similar, okay? Ensure that you are downloading the right application, all right? Two-factor authentication become the prime subject nowadays as one of the second defense already. I think a lot of banks, um, even uh, like emails, Google, a lot of applications and some applications. So if you can put the authentication, please uh, activate your two-factor authentication and it definitely will help you to be defense in, in, in protecting yourself and also perhaps for the organization or the group. Now, change passwords regularly. In this is something where everybody, every time all of us, we share this tips. It looks very simple, actually. I think for the last 10 years, I've been saying about this change password, change password, change password. But you'll be surprised that a lot of people um, don't change passwords regularly you know the passwords which they had for the last one years they're still keeping it this is where okay, when there's an um uh, a cyber trap maybe a cyber criminal trying to uh attack or trying to penetrate into your system then they will try you know using this brute force to enter and perhaps if they succeed, you know, that's the end of the game. So ensure that you change passwords regularly. So if you ask me, some people will ask me this question. How often I should do this changing password? Maybe a month, two months? Uh, perhaps it's, it's, it's practical. You can do it maybe once a month. That's very ideal, actually. Keep this in mind, right? And the last thing is log out from any apps after using. A lot of us do not log, log out from any of the apps after using because we like to make our life very much easy. You know, the moment you wake up, whenever you go there, you just quickly click and go in and, you know, play around with the uh, social media applications and you know you want everything easy so try to uh, avoid this mistake once you have done using uh, all the applications ensure that you log out from the apps okay can i have the next slide please All right, tips for journalists, best practice to keep integrity. Now, what is integrity, integrity of uh, for the journalists, all right? This is a very interesting uh, 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 sharing that I would like to put in, in depth, actually. Uh, whenever you write, whenever you source out, whenever you share information, ensure you keep all these points in your mind so at least it will help you to come out with a good and ethical reporting 
which will benefit the public all right now number one share valid source and check before sharing today with so many whatsapp groups right we get information flooded with information sometimes we get confused whether this is a genuine story whether it's a fake story yeah, we do not know so before we and we have this syndrome as well another syndrome is the moment when you get some information you straight away share with other group or with your friends hey this happened that happened don't do that i think the malaysian government especially uh, the communication and multimedia ministry through the awareness program and also cyber security malaysia through the awareness programs if you can look at uh, some of the um, uh, during the bernama news tv1 tv2 they have this small small kind of video raising this awareness think before you share think before you click so all these you have to keep in mind okay this is very important that's number one number two as i said think twice before sharing from others and with others if you're not sure very simple don't share if normally if i'm not sure that this is a genuine news or it could be a 50 50 or a fake news normally i don't share because sometimes because I, I had made the mistake you know there was one uh, story actually uh, was very relevant uh, to the current uh, situation i quickly you know got excited and shared with a couple of people then i went back to the story and then saw the date was two years back so all this kind of things will happen so always ensure when you're sharing okay whether it's a fresh story whether it's a story whether it's a you know modified story all you have to bear that in mind number three share your own source and detail detail it where it has been obtained now it is a very good practice when you share your own writing your own work without any plagiarism okay then you will be very sure all right you'll be very sure to and uh, to share and also be confident to share with everyone all right and also very important you have to specify at the bottom of your story where you have obtained or at least the source of the story to look and show okay the 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 genuinity of the article so that is very important there okay please keep that in mind number four genuine image audio and video required now again there are so many fake um, images audio and video out there so ensure that get from the right source from the legitimate source before putting up in your story and also when you're writing your reports and sharing with others number five check for any fake news okay how do you check for any fake news? talk uh, uh, much more deeper, uh, much more detail in the next slide okay i'll just keep on this and finally be careful with trading messages from whatsapp group always okay i have said about this again i would like to stress very strongly and reiterate that whenever any messages that comes to your whatsapp or your telegram or your signal it could be a trustworthy group but please 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 ensure that is a genuine message before even you process your story and also you sh share with us okay all right we'll go for the next slide please counting fake news this is a very big phenomenon okay um sometimes people get confused which is 
genuine, which is uh, a fake news. Okay, uh, there are a few tips I would like to share, which normally I use. Normally, our organization we adopt, which we practice to counter this fake news, actually. Okay, number one, check the source of information. Normally, the best way to, to check the source of information is via press statement, press releases. Nowadays, a lot of um, business circles, law enforcement agencies, government agencies, uh, under the uh, unit communicasi corporate or even on the social media trustworthy pages they share the uh, media releases so you can pick it up there okay but ensure it is the genuine page don't go and pick up from the wrong page so you have to ensure on that that is one of the uh, ways we normally do right Number two, obtain permission from the soft publish. Normally, journalists, we have our networking of journalists. We have our pool of connection. So whenever a situation happens, we will get the press release from trusted sources. So you have to build that network, the trusted network you have to build. All this you will learn when you go out and start to work. So all this is very important. Okay, why this is important? It will carry a very good image for yourself and also it will build a good reputation and image for your organization. So building a great network, a good uh, network journalist, it's very essential to write stories and also to share stories to the public. Number three, in overseas, maybe in Europe country or maybe America. So for example, you saw a press statement. I'll give you an example. If you want to write a uh, cybercrime story, for example, a press statement from Interpol. It is available there. So straight away, rather than just picking up, plugging it, and you know, copy and paste and put the photo and you know, put it up. Usually, what I'll do, I'll take an extra mile, a proactive approach. I will email them, ask them, "Hey, I'm coming to Asia today. Such and such, I would like to use this press statement with your permission." This is what you should do. This is the practice you should always carry with yourself. Always remember. It's one of the very important things which you will uh, need to use when you go out and work. Okay. Uh, number four, if the source does not allow or feel not confident, avoid posting stories. Okay, there are um, situations, sometimes you will get uh, videos, audios and stories from certain sources, but they will say it is only for interest. Okay, please don't post it. Sometimes if you go and post without getting the permission, you may get into trouble because the other source didn't give you the permission. Okay, I'll give you one example here to make it very clear. When we faced the first uh, movement control order, I think that was in March 18, there was one raid, immigrant raid in uh, Masjid, India area. So there was one guy, uh, we call it a citizen, I don't know, a citizen uh, journalist or whatever. He managed to get this video from this top, you know, where the, the, the immigration doing the Rain, you know, uh, uh, and I'm taking them to the, you know, to the band, the band, Mario, everything. So what happened was, one of the South China Morning Post uh, writer, she took the story and she posted. Right. So I do not know whether 
she got the permission uh, before posting the story. And then later on, uh, um, the, the police and also the communications and multimedia ministry call her up and how to get statements, all this kind of hassle happened. So if let's say your source is not willing to share, or maybe they are 50-50, avoid, do not worry. Maybe you can find different sources, okay? to do your own story. Remember that. Uh, number five, do photo forensic if possible, or at least check the metadata. Now there are so many applications there. Um, Google reverse image, photo forensics and forensically application. Now uh, this is a, a very good tools uh, and tips which you can use, especially whenever um, you get photos. Excuse me, Mr. Ramani. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt your presentation. Uh, I think you have a, um, a a connection problem because we're listening to, oh. yeah, the audio is kind of stuck. No? Uh, no, it's quite okay. Yeah. It's quite okay. 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 So I'll start from the photo forensic. Eh? Okay, I'll start back from the photo forensic. Okay, for the photo forensic, uh, we have a lot of uh, tools out there, like Google reverse image, photo forensic, forensically, where you can verify and also to check the genuinity of any photos which is sent to you, which you have obtained. So at least this will uh, um, make sure that you are posting the right photos. Normally, we journalists, whenever we post photos, we will ask the sender, the source, to share the photos as well. And secondly, we'll ask them, can we use these photos? And then third thing, we will ask, can we quote your name or the organization's name before we post? So all this you have to bear in mind. So these are one of the very important tips you have to uh, keep in mind in order to counter fake news. Some photos also can be checked against day and timestamp. Okay, certain photos like photographers, they usually usually they'll have the timestamp and also they normally put their watermark there. So all these you have to be very careful. If you see any watermarks or any timestamp, don't just simply take and put you know the stories. You have to ask permissions as well. Because when you're working for a very big organization, all these come into play, right? The next point is compare sources with valid news providers. Like in Malaysia, we have Bernama, our Malaysian National News Agency, where you can get all the, you know, uh, genuine, legitimate news sources. Then you have the AFP, which is uh, 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 France-based uh, news agency. They have been there for uh, quite a number of years. I think, if not mistaken, I think almost um, 100 years. And we have this Reuters. This AFP and Reuters normally you use for uh, international content. They are the trustworthy ones. So you can trust them. Okay. And perhaps other local media. Okay, who are the local medias here? We have the Star, we have Free Malaysia Today, we have Malaysia Kini, we have the Vibes, okay? Okay, if you are taking the stories from them, quote them. Don't forget that. Always give credit. Perhaps maybe you can put it in the story or perhaps at the end of the story. Giving credit is very important whenever you take any stories from others. And finally, which I always encourage most of my journalists is to produce your own story. Go out and source out your own story. Go and build your network and ensure that you get your own story and your own photo and you are, a, and you are safe. And whenever you write, like we have discussed before, keep a copy, right? Keep the photos in a safe place, right? Keep the audio if you have, keep the video. It will be a very 
good reference points in the future. Okay, the next slide, please. Does cybersecurity protect you? Any organization encounter fake news? Yes, of course, cybersecurity does cover all this. Again, I'm coming back to the human factor, the human layer that we need to give emphasis. All right. Although we have all the defenses, all the applications, all the tools, all the toolkits, again, it boils down to human factor. That is very important. If you are not alert, if you are not aware what is happening out there, if it's someone trying to cheat you, someone trying to do social engineering against you, someone trying to do clickbait. I, 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 I heard someone was asking about the question earlier to one of the panelists. Yes, all this you have to be vigil. I'll share with you what here. Very recent thing happened to me. Today is the last Monday and then last Friday. All from people actually, they'll be calling using this WhatsApp number, an unknown number. Then they will like to offer you the pay cost and then. And when when you say no, no, we are you're not interested, and you put down, and then you 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 block the number. After two days, they will find another way. You know, same big pay, they will find another way to trap you. And I noticed that mostly the social engineering, the cyber criminals, they have this this this, this kind of tendency, this modest operand, right, where they have certain time when you're Busy. Okay, when is the busy period? Normally, the morning period, eight to ten. When you're rushing to work, uh, during lunch hours, you're rushing for lunch or after lunch. Okay, evening time when you're going back, you have to, you know, go back. You have to pick up your parents, or you know, if those are married, you have to pick up your kids. Okay, that's the time when they will try to call you. You know, when you're in the middle, that is where they try to trap you. So all this happens during this time. So always remember, you have to be vigilant. You have to be alert and you have to be aware whom you're talking to. Okay? Not, not only maybe on WhatsApp call, even on uh, Facebook. Mr. Romani, are you okay? Are you there? I think Mr. Romani's internet uh, is lost for a bit. Yes, yes, okay. I can see you. No worries, no worries. We will come back. All right. Okay, cool. It happens sometimes. <laughs> hope, hope nobody is trying to hack. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's understandable. It's understandable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll go back to this. Um, the last.
yeah, I was talking about the human factor. So uh, as I put my emphasis, always remember, be alert, be vigil, and be aware what is happening. So before I end up this, this uh, slide, uh, I just like to share another example, a real example, which really happened in Facebook. You see, I, I hardly use Facebook, but there was one guy, I do not know who is this, this person, suddenly tagged me into one, this group, you know, and put some lewd uh, videos. So I said, what is this, you know? So it's very simple, quickly delete, block and report to Facebook. That's it. Don't even try to click it. Sometimes we have this tendency. Hey, what kind of video is that? What kind of photo is that? Maybe, you know, sometimes, you know, we call it gatal tangan, you know, ichi. You want to go and press the thing. Don't even do that. Sometimes, you know why? The moment you click, you, you can be taken to another link. Where, you know, sometimes they will have ways to penetrate into your mobile or anything can happen. So... Don't don't take the risk. Just just block it. All right. Remember that. OK, we will go for the next slide. Please. OK, summing up, uh, we are about 320. We have another 10 minutes to go. OK, I'll take about five minutes here. How to protect your organization. OK, this is an overall perspective. Now we have been talking about individually whenever you write your stories. You know, uh, how to protect yourself. Okay, what are the tips, what are the best practices out there which you can follow? Now, how your organization, especially this refers to the IT department. I always um, advise and uh, give tips and emphasis that we need to have backups. Okay, why backups? Um, for the last one, two years, we see a lot of this ransomware happening. If you go and read news, you go and Google up ransomware. Even in uh, Asian News Today, we, uh, we have covered up a number of studies uh, about ransomware. Uh, ransomware. Uh, even in ESPC, uh, we have covered up uh, about uh, ransomware stories, you know. So whenever you have someone, uh, especially the cyber criminals, they come in and then they, they, they take over your system, they lock it. Normally, they lock it means they kunchi, they lock it, they use encryption where you even yourself cannot open it up. So the only way to, to, to keep your business running up and running is when you have backups. That is why it is one of the best practices is you need to have these backups. So when you have these backups, you can roll back and use this backup and run, you know, the system, you know, the, you know, the, the applications or whatever you have in your organization. So always remember that. Number two, do periodic, weekly, monthly backup. I do not know how many people um, does this, but whenever I think um, Windows 10, you know, sometimes when you are doing your work, suddenly you let's say, you know, before you switch off, please backup, please update. Uh, my Microsoft wants to update. So imagine even operat operating system itself does its own backup. So the same thing for your applications which you have on your uh, mobile phone or maybe on your laptop, on your desktop, wherever it is, make sure you do at least, you know, two weeks once or a monthly backup. The best is two weeks once. Okay. So this is re will, will really help you out a lot. Okay. That's number two. Number three, check against spyware, malware, and new viruses. Okay, how do you do that? Clean. Okay, check your uh, mobile phones or your laptops, especially for any attachments or any emails, you know. All right, maybe you can do it manually. It is very tedious job, actually. So if you have the antiviruses, okay, not only Kaspersky, maybe other antiviruses. Are there are so many antiviruses out there. You can use that as a line of defense. So that is one of the very interesting toolkit, which can help you and also protect you from your daily routines, right? 
So four, check against any attempted hacking activity. Okay, now this is normally monitored by your IT department. So this one, you don't really have to worry. This is not your job actually. But if you're individually, maybe uh, on the face, uh, maybe on the Facebook. Okay, let's see if you're very active, you know, uh sharing these messages messenger this and that be careful when when there's someone uh unknown or a new person trying to chat with you or whatever just be careful again as i said it comes to the human factor right and finally all this the works of it department or your it security consultant although this is in a very large scale okay leave it to them but when it comes to smaller simpler uh, applications trying to do uh, as much of updates backups and also the first line of defense which i have shared in all my slides and also the other uh, panelists have shared since morning okay now i would like to open the floor for more questions so Please be free to ask questions. Thank you. All right. For Ms. Romani, all the questions that are going to you will be asked in the Q&A session. So we have to wait for a bit. Um, sadly, this session has come to an okay. end. And it's really eye-opening and, and, and insightful sharing. Thank you so much for Mr. Romani Prakanan for joining us today and uh, addressing this compelling topic. But uh, everyone, don't leave yet right now uh, because we are having a Q&A session with the participants. Also, please take note that question submissions are now closed for the session. Thank you very much. All right, now um, it is time for the Q&A session. So I see quite a lot of questions are, that are being asked in the chat box. So without further ado, the first question I have in my hand is from Zulaika um, from UITM Sha'alam. She has a question. Um, in Malaysia, uh, what are the cyber threats used by the government to spy on journalists or gain access to their personal data? And how do those threats affect news publishing? Okay, thanks, uh, Zulaika. I think I saw this question as well in the first uh, panelists. Now, to be honest, uh, there is no cyber threats being used against journalists. Okay. Uh, I've been in the industry for the last 10, 15 years. Okay. Uh, we do not have any issues with the government. Uh, whenever you you uh, report, I mean, a genuine. If you share a genuine report, uh, not a fake news, eh? uh, when you educate the public, normally they 
will not use any cyber threats against you. You know, there's no any cyber threats, or even I call it cyber harassment, la. or even physical harassment, or people, some law enforcement call you. There's nothing there. Okay. So in Malaysia, the journey is very safe. I will vow on that because our Malaysian government has been very helpful to all the journalists out there. Only thing is, what we want is we as a journalist. It is our duty, it is our responsibility to educate the public. So we have to take the effort. So we have to do that. Okay. We 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 can get information from this law enforcement agency. And I'm, I'm very surprised actually now a lot of law enforcement agencies, especially the police, PDRM, the immigration department. I think even you can go and see in our Asian news today, we write a lot of stories. From, you know, every day, most of the days, you know, they do these press conferences, they share to the public, we call it, you know, you know they, they share, they want the public to be educated to know what is happening. Um, say, for example, like parcel scam, love scam, uh, e-commerce scam, website scam, so many. Commercial crime investigation department have been putting up a lot of stories. Uh, press statements, they have been doing a wonderful job. Okay, that is one on the PDRM and immigration. Not forgetting on communications and multimedia ministry. Not forgetting on cybersecurity Malaysia. Not forgetting on Naksa. All of them are doing their part. So what we have to do is here, our job, journalist job, okay. We have to take all this information, being as a journalist, let's say if you are intended to become a cybersecurity journalist in the future, take this and write stories, good stories to educate the public, tips how to, to manchaga, you know, to prevent, you know, all this. So this is where we should do. All right, I hope that answers yeah, Laika's answer. question. So we're moving on to the next question from Webex as well. This is from Ifa Saleh and she said, Good evening, sir. I am aware that changing passwords regularly is one of the human defense and log out from any apps after using, but I cannot understand why they exist, why the remember me exists options for our convenience while that simple which can put all our information in jeopardy. What's your opinion on that matter? I think what she's trying to ask is, why do we need yes. to change our passwords? What what passwords? But still yes. have the options to remember the password in the website. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. A very, very good question. Thank you, thank you. See, there is two two things you have to look into this. We have so many applications. You know, sometimes we humans, especially like you know, like I'm getting old. We tend to forget passwords. Sometimes we mix up passwords. You know. Then the second thing you'll do, go and look for forget password. Then a lot of application, especially this developer, you know, that they came up with this an idea of having remembering password. Okay. Now this remembering password is something where it is up to you whether you want to use it or not. Normally, usually I don't use it. Okay, because sometimes, let's say you. you Remember part your laptop. Let's say your 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 login, your panel login, you know. Somebody, maybe your kids or someone else goes in and then just you 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 just click the thing. Using log login, you can go in already. So so uh, if, if if can don't use that. So coming back to the question, although they have this changing password and remembering. Password. It is something the developers are trying to find ways you know, giving uh, uh, ample choices whether you want to remember or you know to change passwords. If you ask me my personal opinion, if can do not use that that remember password or remind password if if possible, because that itself sometimes you'll tend to make mistakes. There was once I will tell you. One of my friends uh, uh, borrowed his laptop to me. So I wanted to use Facebook. Okay. So I click www.facebook.com. The best part, his username and password was there. So only just one click. 
I just can go in and I can do all the nasty stuff if I want to do. So if can avoid that. I know a lot of people like to remember the it automatically so always just just ignore it. Just say if can not to use password. That is my opinion. Normally that is what I do. All right, now we're moving on to questions from YouTube because we have a YouTube live stream going on right now. Um, Hidayah from UTEM is asking okay. two questions. She is asking, what are the top five cyber crimes that always happen in Malaysia? And her second question is, does data anonymization help us as journalists and, our so and are our sources safe? Okay, I will answer the first question, uh, then uh, I will ask you about the second question. Eh? Okay, what are the top five uh, uh, cyber, uh, sorry again? The top five cyber crimes that happens in Malaysia. Uh, okay, I don't have the statistics with me here, okay, because I don't want to make it wrong. But if you can uh, go and Google up, I think um, if not, if you go, if you can go to www.asianewstoday.com, yesterday, very interestingly, our Prime Minister Tan Sri Mohidin Yassin, uh, wait, um, uh, Mr. Romani, uh, I just want to ask, sorry, um, are you intentionally closing your camera? <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, because we can't see anything, oh, we can't okay. see your face. Okay. Okay, give me a second, huh? One second, I'm just pulling on the report. I just want to read it, read it to you. All right, all right, sorry. Second. Just one second, huh? All right, Mr. Romani, take your time. Okay. You can hear me, Shaza? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, on June 28, we reported. Uh, in, it's in Asian News Today. There's a story there. If you can go and find. Cybersecurity complements efforts to accelerate economic growth, says PM Uydin. Right? Okay. Uh, okay. In, in, the, in the story, it says that the Prime Minister said it as such, it has become one of the government's main focus areas to complement efforts in accelerating the economic growth of this uh, country, right? Now, if, if I want to give you the statistics here, okay, I don't have it right with me, but if later on, if you want me, I can email it to you. Then we make much more better because there's uh, differences. But normally, normally what we have is this, we have like, uh like like uh, if not mistaken eh, but i have been need to double check again that is why it's better if i can email um uh, normally it is something to do with social engineering uh we have uh, intrusion then you know there are a couple of things so i just need to check back on the hierarchy which i don't have that with me at the moment but if you want i can email it to you okay so that's one okay the second question the second question is: Does that better anonymization help us as journalists and our source and are are our sources safe? Sorry, data. Data anonymization. Data. I didn't get it actually. Uh, data anonymization, like um, uh, anonymity. Probably using VPN and stuff like that. Oh, okay. okay. May, may, uh, may I know why why uh, you want to use VPN? Really? What is uh, the reason you want to use VPN? 
according to the question, uh, she's asking, does it help with being a journalist and is the so are the sources safe? Uh, well, well, OK. I you see, normally, if, if I want to get an information from a source, you, you don't have to be very so secretive unless you're doing some uh, Sarawa report when you story <laughs> you, you know what i mean if, if you know if you're writing a story which is going to benefit the public which is not illegal which is not uh, i don't i don't see the fake news la. maybe it could be a uh, uh, misleading uh, kind of a story i think you you don't have to worry about this vpn you know secure communication i think you know with an open source platform, you can communicate or make phone calls or some Zoom meeting, whatever you can do it. You don't have to worry about uh, that. Nothing will happen. Nobody will nobody will come and attack you in the middle, you know, like we call it man in the middle. There's nothing there. Nobody will come and steal your information. So far, it doesn't happen like that, you know. I mean, I mean from my experience, unless you are an investigative journalist, Maybe you have something very uh, expose you want to report and this and that. Then maybe yes, that is that's a different topic itself, lah. You know, which I I don't want to go very in depth. Uh, that there are certain mechanisms. Yes, we have to need to follow. All right. Now we're moving uh, on to another question from Webex. This is from Arfa from okay. UITM. From she is asking okay. about tips or advice for future journalists that are hesitant to cover news that are risky or them meaning that there are consequences if they got reported by the news, for example, going to be attacked or getting put in jail. Ah, okay. uh, very good, very good question. You see, um, when we started, uh, like I said, when we go, uh, our editors, they will push us. Whether you like it or not, they will push us. They will say, Ram, you have to go and look out for this story. You have to look out for your sources. Now, how do you do that? Number one, like as I said in my slides, which I was you know, pointing out, emphasizing, you have to build your network. Okay? Trustworthy network. Trustworthy sources. That's one. Nowadays, I notice that a lot of this these journalists who graduates actually, they find a lot of shortcuts. Okay, what are the shortcuts they find? They don't go out. They don't go and meet people. Very rare. They like to go and do this Google. Maybe from this website, that website, you know, copy a bit here, copy a bit there, you know, this and this and that. They come out with this. this it, it, it is nothing wrong, perfectly all right. But again, when you build the repo, when you go and meet certain sources, then you can get a solid story, number one. Sometimes you can get scoop. I will share my experiences when I start as a political writer. Let's say I want to write something about, uh, okay, now we talk about COVID-19. Okay, who is the minister? who's in charge of vaccination, get in touch with him, get his phone number, not only his Satyosa Akbar, get his connection, okay? Try to make contact. It is not easy, but you have to put effort. That is how we used to do. When, okay, I, I will share, okay, that is one, uh, my real ex uh, sharing experiences. When I used to write crime stories those days, uh, when I was in FMT, Malaysia Outlook, and even Asian News Today, the back then, IGP, I used to go and cover IGP press conferences. Every Friday, we have uh, uh, press conferences. I have IGP's number, uh, Tan Sri Khaled's number, mobile phone number. I have uh, the Attorney, Attorney General's phone number. So normally, what I do is, let's say, I don't get any scoops. I don't get any stories. I'll message them first. Tan Sri, such as such, can I get, you know, if... At least just that one, two sentence, if you reply, that itself a story for you already. So this is where I want the future journalists to 
move forward, to be proactive, to come out with these stories. This is where I, I noticed there's a bit of lacking there, where we need to push, actually. If you can do this, you can become a very uh, notable and distinguishable, uh, you know, a, a wonderful journalist in the future. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Ramani. The next question is from Hasif, who is studying a business major in UniKL. Um, he's asking, like, in your opinion, uh, as a member of the public community, how can we be alert and do uh, checkings to make sure that um, fake news uh, isn't widespread or that we're not reading into fake news? Okay how we can be alert and also we are not reading into fake news. I will share my tips as a journalist, as an editor, what I do. Okay. The first thing, your WhatsApp will be bombarded. So many things will come into your WhatsApp. This thing happened, that thing happened. Very, the simplest thing, a simplest thing, you know, the simplest, I mean, the easiest example I will share with you, especially the daily COVID-19, you know, the statistics. Sometimes one or, you know, in, the, in that weekly one or twice, you know, sometimes you'll get the fake figures. Sometimes one fellow will start to send very early. Then everybody will start to share. Don't share. Ensure whether Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia have issued that or not. So how do you do that? Go to Kementerian uh, Kesihatan Malaysia uh, uh, Facebook website. They have the uh, official telegram. Even Tan Sri Norisham Abdullah, the DG. Normally, he issues, uh, you know, the statistics. So all this, verify first. That is what I want to say here. Before you want to write or you want to share, this is how you can fight uh, fake news or, you know, this uh, disinformation. Yes, it is out there, but you have to check. It, it, it is with you, all right? It, no one else will check. So if you don't do that, then if you miss mistakenly sent it out, then a lot of people are going to get that, you know, that fear and panic, oh, suddenly there's a rise of, you know, statistics and this and that, blah, blah, blah. So don't do that, okay? So ensure you check first, that's one. Another thing is, there are uh, good uh, sources like medias, like we have Bernama, the legitimate news agencies, we have uh, like Free Malaysia, Twitter, Malaysia, Kini, the Vibes, even Asian News Today, we take uh, from the government, right? TV3, TV1, RTM. So all these, they will filter. We have processes. Okay, we have our internal process. We have to filter first. Once we have filtered, then only we will push the story. Sometimes there are situations, you know, I have cleared a copy. Just one push of button, I just want to click. Luckily, sometimes there's a fake news. I stop. If imagine I have could have, you know, published the story, what will happen? The reputation of my organization is gone. So we will become, you know, like a, face, a fake news agency. See? So all this, it is the duty of the editor. Uh, normally, this is where the editors will come in as the defense, you know, they call it the firewall uh, in the organization. Okay, so I hope it answers. All right, yes. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Izian from UPM. She is asking, hello, Mr. Ramani. I would like to know what can students do to care for their data in their laptop as antivirus monthly payments are just not in their budget as a student. Do you have any alternatives for free antivirus softwares? Softwares. Okay, yeah. Very practical question, yeah, because sometimes certain students, you know, monetary wise, uh, maybe if you're not, um, uh, I mean, uh, not ready to install the antiviruses, perhaps keep backup, okay, uh, you know, save backups, whenever you, you, you keep your files, like in the slides I was telling you, keep your files in an orderly, neat order, you know, wherever you put all the folders, ensure that, that's that's very important. And again, and again, it's actually it's revolving back to one thing only, the human factor. If you think you as the first line defense, they will come to you first. You as the first line defense, you know, can protect yourself, can be alert, can be vigil, 
you know, counter all these kind of any attacks, you know, people are trying to do an attempt, then I think you don't have to worry, you can be safe. So for you know, although there are certain uh, attempts, you know, people trying, like I was sharing with you examples, people, big pay, they call, WhatsApp, you know, they try to add you, emails. Now, emails, normally, I don't get it anymore. Usually. Okay, so you just need to be aware whether this is the right, uh, what you call genuine link. Okay, let's say whether it comes from bank, say for example, okay, check the link. Don't just simply just go and you know, click it. Sometimes it could be a, a bogus link, you know, it straight away takes you to another one. That is why a lot of banks, if you notice, even they have been telling, this is not, it's not new. They have been telling, you know, again and again, you know, type. You know, www.maybank.com, you know, blah, 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 www.facebook.com, you know, all these, all, all these are tips actually will help you. Although it looks very simple, but sometimes, you know, sometimes we neglect actually. We say, I know, I know better, you know. So we have to be, you know, always be vigil, as I say, be aware and, you know, don't fall for this trap. All right, yeah. Mr. Armani. Uh, one last question we have from YouTube, which is from Noraz Linda Muhammad. She is asking, sir, how would we ensure that our privacy data or information is protected as some information are required to be filled in our social media platforms or even in shopping online websites? Okay, this one, uh, if you are filling up your details, your credentials to, I think, uh, the major websites, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a quite a broad question. If, if, it, if it's, it's, um, it's a trustworthy website, I think you don't have to worry, okay? Uh, but if it's something which is very fishy, I will never ever uh, encourage you all to okay uh, you, you know you know you'll be you'll be laughing at this will be a surprising thing huh? a lot of people of us uh, use online banking uh, but uh, even uh, i hardly use online banking i even i don't activate online banking even sometimes when i go to these uh, banks uh, the bank officers ask me you know why you don't use online banking i said no uh, being a cyber security expert sometimes you know although yes we have all these things in place, but you know sometimes i could make mistakes tendencies to fall for the trap so likewise uh, when you are doing you know e-commerce transaction be you know uh, business transactions or whatever you know buying purchasing or whatever make sure it is a trustworthy website ensure that don't simply just you know maybe it's a, a, a newcomer you know just want to make some fast money out of you know from you then you know they just take you for a ride then suddenly you're waiting, waiting, you paid everything, then you're waiting, waiting, the things doesn't uh, come uh, to your end. I think there was one uh, awareness video, if not mistaken, I saw this somewhere last week, I think. Uh, again, yes, again, uh, communications and multimedia ministry in Burnama, they were sharing this video, actually. So there are a lot of videos out there. So, you know, whenever you have this kind of video, so I, I you know, before we end, I would like to, you know, share and I would like to advise all this e colloquium, especially when the mu uh, news agencies, media outlets, whenever they write stories, to share with all your students. Educate them, educate you with your friends, the videos, the audios, everything. So at least this makes you, you know, uh, more uh, aware with the situation and what is happening. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Armani. Um, and that concludes the Q&A session we have for today. Thank you very much, Mr. Armani, for, coming, for answering the questions with such interesting takes and views. Um, it is hoped that the sharing we have just now would benefit us in all possible ways, especially in protecting ourselves from cyber threats and dangers. Also, gaining awareness on preventing uh, dangers, especially for journalists and future journalists. So um, a quick reminder to all newcomers of the event, please make sure to click the link in the chat box there to register yourself for this event. Thank you very much.
All right, everyone, we're going to have a short photo session. So everyone, please open up your camera for a, a quick photo session. Uh, please be ready. Make sure to look your best. All right, make sure to smile and um, say cheese. Okay. <laughs> All right, make sure everyone open your, your camera. Okay, let's go. Sheesh. Wait, eh? Okay. One, two, three. Smile. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Freestyle. One, two, three. Every time we are having our photo session, there will be a lot of photo. One, two, three, of course. Let's go. One, two, three. Another one. One, two, three. Another one. One, two, three. This is our last session, so this will be our last photo session. One, two, three. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you everyone. Um, now is the time uh, that we have been waiting for, uh, which is the giveaway. Um, are you guys excited to spin the wheel and win two sets of Bluebells complete sets? Each set is worth our M259 ringgit, as you can, uh, as you guys can see on the screen. Okay, we'll wait for a bit. All right, as you guys can see on the screen right now, we have a giant roulette wheel and we can't wait to be rolled by Zulfakri. All right, let's count together. In 3, 2, 1, Zulfakri, Zulfakri will help us to spin the wheel. So everybody, count with me. 3, 2, 1, spin the wheel. All right, the winner is number 195. We will um, announce who the winner is and inform you who the winner is um, after we finish this roulette wheel. All right, we're going for the second round. So count with me. Three, two, one, spin. The winner for this time is the winner number 20. All right. Congratulations to all the winners of the giveaway. Um, so the winners must claim their prizes from Iza by sending her a message. Her number will be in the chat box. So please check your private chat as well for further details. Thank you very much. All right. Now, uh, moving on to the next session, we will be announcing the winners for the giveaway sponsored by Sugar Bomb. Um, all winners must claim their prizes from Iza, so please check your private chat as well. Now, it's time for me to announce six winners for those uh, who asked the most interesting questions in the chat box. Um, these prizes are sponsored by Sugar Bomb, as I said uh, just now. So, are you guys ready? Are you, are you guys hoping to win the sugar bomb giveaway? All right. All right, drum roll. All right, the first lucky winner is Amiral Amin from the first session. Congratulations, Amiral Amin. Make sure to contact uh, make sure to contact Isa. Uh, her number is in the chat box, all right? Okay. All right, now we're moving on to the second winner. So. 
The second winner is Azim Omar. Azim Omar, are you there? If you're there, you can raise your hand or you can open your mic and say, I'm here. Azim Omar. All right. For the third winner, we have... Daniel Uzair. Daniel Uzair, are you here? Are you here? You can raise your hand or just open your mic and say, I'm here. Daniel? All right. Okay, Daniel's here. Okay, so for the first winner, we have... Danish Afwan. Danish Afwan, are you here? If you're here, raise your hand or open your mic and say, I'm here. I'm here. All right, Danish Afwan. Congratulations. Okay, now we're moving on to the fifth winner of the giveaway. Hidaya or Aslina Salamai. Daya and or Aslina Salamai, are you here? Please just ra raise your hand and open your mic or open your mic and say you're here. Hidaya. All right. Now we're moving on to the sixth winner. Muhammad Asif. Muhammad Asif, are you here? If you're here, you can raise your hand and open your mic. Say, I'm here. Muhammad Asif. All right. Congratulations to all the winners. And thank you to those who participated in this giveaway sponsored by Sugar Bomb. So to all the winners, remember, you must claim your prizes from Isa by sending her a message. Um, her number will be in the chat box. So please make sure to check your chat box and also your private chat as well for further details. Thank you. All right, everyone, now it's time for me to announce the five winners who have taken part in our pop quiz, pop quiz excuse me, contest on Instagram. So all the winners um, have followed our official Instagram at Colloquium43 and the sponsors Instagram, which are Bluebell Skincare at Bluebell Skincare Official, um, Sugar Bomb at Sugar Bomb HQ, and lastly, Empire Pondo Atto at Empire Pondo Atto on Instagram. So all five winners have answered the pop quiz correctly, and the gift box that they are winning today contains products sponsored by Bluebell Skincare, Sugar Bomb, as well as Empire Pondo Atto. So, are you guys ready? Are you guys nervous to find out who wins? Is it you? So, drum roll, please. All right, the first winner we have is Fatin from the account 50 Shades of Aten. Aten, are you here? If you're here, please raise your hand or turn on your microphone and say, I'm here. Fifty Shades of Fatin. Okay, Fatin's here, yes. Congratulations to Fatin. All right, now we're moving on to the next winner. Drum roll, please. The second winner for this giveaway is Nazira Tree. 
two, one. Nazira Umaira, are you here? Please just raise your hand or open up, open up your mic and say you're here. Nazira Umaira. All right, now we're moving on to the third winner. Drum roll, please. The third winner is Geraint T. Gillian. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, Geraint, I'm sorry. <laughs> is Geraint or Geraint here? I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, Please open up your mic uh, again. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Geraint or Geraint here? I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Let's actually my brother. Geraint or Geraint here? I don't know how to Oh, yes, yeah, he, the way to pronounce his name is Jirayan Jilin. Oh, Jirayan oh, yeah, I'm, I'm on behalf of him. All right, congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we're moving on to the fourth winner. All right, the fourth winner is Hafiz Minul. Hafiz Minul, are you here? Hafiz, if you're here, please raise your hand or open up your mic. Hafiz, are you here? All right, we're moving on to the fifth one. The fifth one is Izyan Zul on Instagram. Her name is Nur Izyan. Is Izyan is? I'm sorry. Is Izyan here? If you're here, please raise your hand and open up your mic and say I'm here. Nur Izyan. All right, I can see Izyan there. Congratulations to Izyan, um, congr uh, as well as to all the winners. Thank you very much to those who participated in this contest. Contest probably sponsored by Bluebell Skincare, Sugar Bomb, and Empire Pondo Atto. Again, to all winners, you must claim your prizes from Iza by sending her a message. Her number will be in the chat box. So please make sure to ch check this chat box and also your private chat box. Uh, for further details. Thank you very much. All right, congratulations to all the winners on winning the giveaway, Lucky Draw and Pop Quiz. Thank you so much for supporting our event. You guys are an important part of this special event and we are really appreciative of your presence. So before this program comes to an end, um, we would like to say thank you to our sponsors. Um, without them, this event would have, uh, wouldn't have been a success. So for our first sponsor, we have Bluebell Skincare. Thank you so much for sponsoring us. Bluebell offers skincare that is not only effective, but also harmless to your body and skin. The natural ingredients help you to become the best version of yourself, giving, us, giving your face a healthy glow. Go check out and follow their official Instagram at Bluebell Skincare Official. For the next sponsor, we have Sugar Bomb. Thanks a million to them for sponsoring our event. I bet you guys are familiar with this brand. Their billboards are everywhere. Sugar Bomb is famous for their tagline, Duduk rumah pun wangi. Sugar Bomb is specialized in formulating and selling long-lasting fragrances with internationally approved ingredients. Go visit and follow their official Instagram at Sugar Bomb HQ for a variety of perfumes and air fresheners. And lastly, our third sponsor for today is Empire Pondo Atto. Thank you so much, uh, Pondo Atto, for sponsoring us. Pondo Atto um, offers us a very variety of products under one company where they all sell famous local products such as Susuni Lofa, Eng's Popcorn, Real Keys, and many more. For this event, they have sponsored us with Crunchy Caramel Popcorn by Eng's Popcorn, Kacang Wanis uh, by Wanis. Uh, Kacang Wanis by Wani Snacks HQ and Susi Nilofa by Nilofa HQ. Go check them out now and make sure to follow their Instagram at Empire Pondo Atto.
All right, so before you leave the room, please remember to fill in the feedback form to enable you to receive an e-certificate. Please give us your honest feedback by clicking on the link given in the chat box or you may scan the QR code displayed on your screen right now. Make sure to fill in your details as well and submit the form. The e-certificate will be given to you via email and your feedback is extremely valuable to us uh, in which it allows us to continually improve and serve you better in the future. With that, we have finally come to an end of this session. So it's time for me to sign off. Thank you very much to all the participants. Um, till, our till, till our paths cross again in the future. Thank you so much, everyone.